Well, all right, Hearth and Homies, thanks for tuning in tonight. We've got a great show for you. We've got yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey as Johnny Dollar. And of course, these are the 15 minute, five part episodes. And I've taken each of those and combined them down to one episode. Up first, we have the Salt City Matter. Now this one is actually missing episode two. Unfortunately, episode two is just lost to history. We don't know where it is, <laughs> but don't worry. I think uh, when episode three recaps, It'll bring you up to speed on everything you've missed in that episode. After that, we've got the the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And after that, stay tuned for the Shepherd matter. Now, don't forget, Hearth and Home Entertainment is entirely supported by viewers like you. Yes, YouTube is free, but it costs time and money to put together these shows and run a channel like this. And after trying to get monetized by YouTube, them saying yes, and then saying no, and then saying yes, and then no, we said, that's okay, we don't need the YouTube Partner Program. We've got the Hearth and Home Entertainment Partner Program. That's right, the Johnny Dollar Club. It starts out at just a dollar a month. There's other levels you can choose, but I wanted to make it available and accessible to everybody to be a part of this channel. Now I'm adding some free exclusive content just for Johnny Dollar Club members. So for a dollar a month, you get to support the channel and you get some free exclusive content just for you. Now I wish I could offer a ad-free experience, but unfortunately YouTube is still gonna run ads on the channel. They just don't share that revenue with us. But the exclusive content on Patreon should be ad free. So click the link below and check out the Johnny Dollar Club. I mean a dollar a month, that's less than a cup of coffee. As for tonight's show, once again, we've employed the OTR visual radio to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. Of course, since it's Johnny Dollar, we've got some special footage that was shot for us by Jake Helbach that gives us the opportunity to give a unique visual storytelling. Don't forget to check out his channel. I'll put a link down in the description below. He's so close to a thousand subscribers. It would be great if we could just push him over that thousand mark and help him get his channel monetized. He's got some great content over there. So after <laughs> this show, you can click the link and check him out. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Johnny. Sam Rubin. Oh. What's the matter, kid? I don't know. It's a feeling I get every time I hear your voice on the phone, Sam. Now, what does that mean? Well, the last time you called, I took a job and had to hock my watch for cable fare in Hong Kong. That's what it means. <laughs> so I bought your new watch, didn't I? What's on your mind? Ed Julian. Ed Julian? So long, Sam. No, no, no. Wait, wait a minute. Johnny, Johnny, this is important. I need help. If you're fooling around with somebody like Ed Julian, you sure do need help. Go call a cop. They can't help me. I'm calling you. Johnny, for old time's sake. <sighs> I'll see you after breakfast, Sam. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Samuel Rubin and Associates, Insurance Brokers, Majestic Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Salt City matter. I didn't know it was going to be that, Salt City, I mean. But I did know the name Ed Julian. Every policeman in the country knew that name. My first impulse was to hang up the phone on Sam, but I didn't. Instead, I spent 85 cents, that's my first item, on cab fare to get me to Sam's office. Welcome, Johnny. Long time no see. Come on in. Sit down. Have a smoke. I'll Sam Rubin about looked about the same as I remembered him, and he acted about the same. He shook my hand, pushed a cigar at me, held up a $160 lighter, and smiled. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, I'd like to have you on my permanent payroll. Well, now, that'd be something. <laughs> Are you making me an offer or just talking? No, I suppose I'm just talking. But you're good to look at, you know? It gives me confidence. You no, know, a little outfit like I got here, I can't afford high-priced talent like yourself for a steady diet. Why don't you sit down, kid? You'll pardon me, Sam, but I don't feel sorry for you. You're right about every kind of insurance that's ever been issued. Oh, well, yeah, sure, but nothing like those big operations that you're used to. This is all little bitty companies. Yeah, so I make a living. A man having his own company, running it by himself. Ten of his own companies. So it's ten times as much trouble, though. 
Listen, what do you know about Ed Julian, Johnny? He had quite a name in Chicago and Los Angeles, Hoboken. I thought he was in jail these days. Oh, Ed? No. Got himself out of jail. Must have been three, four years ago. Sure, went into enterprises in uh, Florida, California. Very legitimate fellow. Oh, I'm sure he is. Let's get to the point, Sam. But you're working for me, aren't you? I don't know whether I am or not. I haven't heard what it's all about. About? It's about Ed Julian. That's what it's about. All right, I'll lay it right out for you. Here. Look at this. $50,000. $50,000 I got to pay his widow if something happens to him. You'll pardon me again, Sam, but when you collected that first premium on him, and I take it you sold him $50,000 worth of life insurance, you should have thought of this part of it. What, has something happened to him? No, nothing's happened to him. I'm afraid something's going to happen to him. I'd have to get this money up. (laughs) I'm just going to listen to you talk because it doesn't seem to do much good asking you questions. So (laughs) go ahead, Sam. Talk, talk. Maybe something will come up. All right. But, Johnny, don't be shrewd with me, huh? Now, the policy was issued maybe a month ago. I personally, (laughs) I personally, I wouldn't sell a man like Ed Julian life insurance, any kind of insurance. He's not a calculated risk. He's a lousy, long-sighted bet. Man like that. The enemies he makes. Oof. He's a bad fellow all the way around. But... Here it is. It's on paper. I'm stuck if anything happens to him. Now, Johnny, the man's living in San Francisco now, and all I want is you go to him and ask him to cancel the policy, okay? (laughs) Sam, how did you ever get the insurance? No, no, Johnny, please. Why don't you go to San Francisco? Handle it yourself. Johnny, I can't. I'll tell you why. Because you know and I know there's no way for me or you or anybody else to approach Ed Julian and ask him to cancel out this policy. What it amounts to is that you want me to go there and keep an eye on him until you can break the policy. Isn't that it? Not necessarily, Johnny. What do you mean, not necessarily? All right, all right. So you're right. Listen, I heard through the grapevine there's a large collection of Ed's old friends visiting in and around San Francisco just a few days ago. It makes me very nervous. I have already a blood pressure condition. Friends who might want to shoot him down? Yeah, that's the kind of people, yes. $50,000 payoff would hit me very hard this week. All right, next week maybe not so hot, but this week, oh boy, the market. Are you playing with company funds? No, no, it's a calculated risk I'm entitled to take with company funds. They entrust me. All right, all right. Now, will you please sit down and study this thing out with me? What's? I'm always asking you to sit down. You never do. I also never study anything with you. Sam, how much? Well, expenses, $500 bonus. Why, Sam? No, no, wait, wait, wait. Johnny, you're so impatient. I'll make it a thousand, thousand dollars bonus. Take care of yourself. No, no, See no, you. Listen, Johnny, look, look, Johnny, all you have to do is keep him alive till I break the policy responsibility. My lawyers can do that. They told me it'll take a couple of days. I don't have to do anything, Sam. How'd you get that policy? It was in a bundle of stuff came in from the coast. Ed Julian took this out under his real name, Eduardo Saccovetti. Now, who knows it's Ed Julian? Skip the gestures and tell me how you do know. Well, my broker out in San Francisco. Her name is... Uh, I don't know, Straubert Street or something like that. She sold it to him. Later on, she found out who he really was. She sent me a wire. So, uh, a thousand's okay, huh? No. So, how much? Twenty-five hundred and You're expensive. crucifying that me! That watch you gave me never kept time. All right, never. all right, all right. Twenty-five hundred. Twenty-five hundred. Expense account item two, $168.73. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. I arrived at eight in the morning. On the way in from the airport, the fog began to roll in from the bay. From my hotel room at the Fairmont, I looked out in time to see the provision barge moving out toward Alcatraz before the fog closed in completely. Somebody said the storm warnings were up all along the coast, and somebody was right. By 11 o'clock, a light rain had begun to patter over the fog-bound Bay City. Item three, 23 bucks, one trench coat. I was wearing it when I spent another buck. Item four, cab fare. This time to get me from San Francisco's Fairmont Hotel to Ed Julian's address on another part of San Francisco's Knob Hill. There in the drizzling rain, I interviewed not Ed Julian, but one of San Francisco's older but more stable residents. The uniform said he was a member of the property police. Hey, hey, you. Uh, Just a minute there. Just a minute. Nobody lives there. I hope your sake, boy, you ain't no Jimmy artist, because I got me a gun under this raincoat. I'm no Jimmy artist. I'm just trying to locate a man named Julian. Ed Julian? That's right. Uh, Mr. Sarcovetti lived here. Well, according to my records, Mr. Sarcovetti and Mr. Julian are the same man. Well, he ain't here now. Moved out bag and baggage a week, ten days ago. Whatever name he used. Uh Uh-huh. Don't suppose you have any idea where he went, do you? Nope. You happen to see him move? 
Yep. Him and his wife and their clothes. Left all their furniture, huh? Didn't have any to leave. This place was furnished for them. They're the kind of people who never own more than they could carry. That's the way I figured them. Fast traveling and short acquaintances. Now, I once knew a fella up in King City. You see, King City's about 45 miles north of here. That's how the Ed Julian matter stood on a rainy morning in San Francisco. Nothing out of the ordinary for Ed Julian. Yet, all around me, there seemed to be some sort of a dark, threatening undertone that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Whatever it was, it troubled me, standing out in the rain, talking to that old man. It still troubled me when I made my way back down the hill and found, to my surprise, that the San Francisco Classified Telephone Directory listed Edward Julian Enterprises. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call. Hello? Hello. I'd uh, like to talk to Mr. Julian, please. He's not in. Secretary's out. Would you like to leave a message? Well, this is Johnny Dollar calling. Uh, he doesn't know me, I'll but I... will leave the message for him. When do you expect him back? Never. The rain was just starting up again as I stood in front of the floor-level office at Powell and Hooker. On the door, it said, Edward Julian Enterprises Incorporated. And below it, it said, walk in. I did. Hello? Hello, who's that? Hello. Uh, hello, who are you looking for? Ed Julian. He isn't around now. Maybe I can help you. Well, maybe you can. I'd like to know something about his enterprises. Why? Oh, I might want to invest some money. <laughs> oh, what's funny about that? You the guy who called me a little while ago? Yeah, I called. I suppose you're the one I talked to. What's your angle? I want to find Julian. So do I. So do a lot of people. What's that name? Johnny Dollar. And I'm Ray Gumby, Ed's attorney. Come on in here. It's warmer. I followed Ray Gumby to the back office of the two-office suite. Watched him as he stood in front of the gas heater. Medium-sized man, 50 or so, wearing a tan sport coat, a wool scarf, a turtleneck sweater. Not exactly the conservative attire usually expected of members of the bar. But then he looked happy about it. Now sit down, Dollar. Have a drink. Thanks, Mr. Gumby. Well, cheers. Mm-hmm. <coughs> now, uh, you ask about Ed's Enterprises. Well, I tell you right now, they aren't much. He has an oil field, a piece of a gambling casino, a piece of a racetrack, and a part of a ship, and part of a smelter works. What does he do a couple of weeks ago? He up and unloads it all. Oh, I've, I've had a little cold with all this weather we've been having. <coughs> Why do you want to find him? To protect him. <laughs> That's cute. Personally, I wish the bum would get pneumonia. He left me holding the sack here. How's that? I formed these corporations for him and acted as chairman on all the boards. Then he sold out from under me. Didn't even bother to say goodbye or pay me off. You want to find him too, then? You bet you. I'm suing for proper fees. Think it'll do any good, Mr. Gumby? No, I don't think so. I mean, as far as me getting my money goes. But if I can get him subpoenaed, and he ignores the subpoena, the court will issue a warrant on contempt charges and throw his carcass in jail for a while. If he was behind the bars and I went to visit him, maybe I could handle him. <laughs> the bars between us, of course. Of course. Yeah. You want another knock? No, thanks. Uh, no. You go ahead. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. It is. Getting him in jail? Yeah. If I can get him served. <clears throat> well, it's not going to be an easy job getting those papers into his hands. Two of my regular boys have already tried and failed. I'm a fool ever to accept such a man as a client. Never do such a thing again. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Mr. Grumby, the man I'm working for said practically those same words to me in Hartford yesterday. It doesn't make me feel any better. I wish it did. And I wish you luck protecting him. Mm. Hey, Mr. Grumby. Something just occurred to me. Now, what's that? Well, now, maybe we could work this out together. How? Huh. You want Julian to be served with a subpoena so you can have the police pick him up. I want him to be safe. And there's no safer spot than the city jail. Hey. Where's that subpoena? Well, right here. And there's a fee in it if you can get it in his hands. Two hundred, maybe? All right. You say two of your men have already tried and failed to get to him. What happened to them? Been to his place on Knob Hill. I was there earlier today. He moved out. I know. But my men went up there to serve him. 
Both of them fell down two flights of stairs. Seems like a myth. Maybe Ed isn't living in such high places these days. I hope not, for your sake, Dollar. Or Johnny Dollar. Uh, yes? Look, Skyline Apartment. Johnny Dollar speaking. What? Maybe you don't remember me, but I remember you. I was there last night and got banged on the head by a pair of hoodlums. I know nothing about it, and I can't talk now. Well, then you can listen. I'm coming over there in about an hour. I hope your two hoods are there when I show up. Will you tell them that for me? I'll deliver the message, if you wish. Do that. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Sam Rubin and Associates, Insurance Brokers, Majestic Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Salt City matter. Expense account item eight, ten dollars. Medical bill for two stitches in my scalp. Item nine, ten cents. One more phone call to the prettiest insurance broker in San Francisco. You said you'd buy me lunch. Something's come up. I don't care what you say. You said you'd meet me. Meet me. Item 10, $2. More of that ever-loving cab fare. This time, I kept the cabbie waiting outside Eleanor Stover's apartment. Johnny. Johnny. Hi, Angel. I didn't want to be a witch, but I did want to see you, if only for a minute. Come in. Can't. My cab's waiting downstairs. But I want... What happened? happened to you? Oh, I argued a little bit with two of Ed Julian's hired hands. He has a little muscle around him these days. No one to worry. Johnny, I feel responsible. Why? Well, like a big dope, I was the one who sold him that insurance policy. Now you have to mix into it and try to keep him alive. You look like the one who needs protection. Well, don't look at it that way. Hmm? If you hadn't sold him the policy, I'd never have come to San Francisco and I'd never have met you. And you wouldn't be here right now. I'll call you later. Ellie. Yes, Johnny? I didn't tell you this part. I'm going to serve a subpoena on him and try to get him to appear in court. I don't expect he'll pay any attention to it, and then they'll issue a warrant for his arrest for contempt of court. I figured he'd be as safe in jail as anywhere else. What subpoena? An attorney who worked on a few deals with him, a man named Ray Gumby. Oh, take care. I went back to my cab and told the driver to take me to the Skyline Apartments. When we pulled up in front, the same kind of things were going on in the same lobby. Well. Hello, Moisha. Oh, Mr. Swift? Let me. Swifty. Swifty. You're in here looking for trouble, and you're going to get it. I thought you found that out once. I sure did, and I sure am. Where's your tall, skinny friend? He's coming. Look. You. <laughs> Well, if it isn't a row, old boy from a hospital, how many times we have to toss you out of here? You've hit your quota. I only get tossed out of one place at one time. What floor is Julian on? The fourth. But that don't get mean... out of my way. Uh, not so fast. I hate to have to mess you up all over again. <laughs> all right, Weisenheimer, this is a knife. This is a gun. Oh, that way, huh? Yeah. Put that thing away, boy. I got two stitches in my scalp from you boys last night. I'll always have a little scar from them. And somehow I think you should have the same. <laughs> Under the circumstances, it seemed like the honest thing to do. I left both of them in the lobby and took the elevator unescorted up to the fourth floor. But I was disappointed once more. Ed Julian didn't answer the door, but a small blonde girl who looked like she might have been having a good cry did. Swifty, what do you want? Uh, you're not Swift. Is Ed Julian here? Swifty didn't let you come up here. He won't let anybody up here. How'd you get inside? Why don't you invite me in and I'll tell you all about it. Are you a policeman? No, ma'am. All right. Why not? Come on in. Whoever you are, mister, you're taking some awful chances. Well, let's say I'm a friend of Ed's. Ed hasn't got any friends and I know all of them. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Where do I find him? I'm Ed's wife. My name's Lorraine. I know you. <laughs> I mean, I know a friend of yours, Eleanor Strober. She said she went to high school with you about ten years ago. Uh, a million years ago. 
At least a million. How did you know her? I'm in the insurance business. Do you expect that back soon? I don't expect anything anymore. No. What do you want to see him about? Business. I'd like to wait for him. Well, you got this far, you might as well. What about Swifty and Luke downstairs? They, uh... They were glad to see me come up. You... You want a drink or something? You ought to take off your hat and coat. It'll be cold for you. When you... Uh, did they do that? Hmm. Yes, it uh, wasn't too easy getting in. Oh, those dirty punks. Can I... Can I fix it or something? Uh, doctor, just tuck two stitches in it. It'll be okay. I'm sorry. You seem like a nice guy. Well, you seem like a nice girl. What? I said you seem like a nice girl. <laughs> Nobody said anything like that to me since I married Ed. You aren't supposed to be nice when I love somebody like Ed Julian. Well, my job is to protect him from who or what I don't know, but to protect him, I want to find him. Well, you won't protect him here. He hasn't been here for a couple of days. Where is he? How should I know where he is? How should I know? I'm only his wife, the hired girl. Those others came in town. What others? Those from the East. Ugly men with... Yesterday... No, no, I... I guess it was the day before. Ed was here with one of them. A man named Chili Winters. They sat right there, drinking, talking. Then they both went out together. I didn't like the way that Chili looked. He looked... Where'd they go? I don't know. Oh, get out of here, Johnny. You're not going to find him here ever. Go on. Beat it. He'll kill me if he found me talking to anybody. He'd kill me. I know he... I didn't want that to happen, so I left. No one was in the lobby to say hello, fire a bullet, or use a blackjack. I spent another hour downtown at the Hall of Justice looking up the record of chilling winters, a list of felonies ranging from armed robbery to assault with a deadly weapon. He'd been convicted twice on the latter charge, once in Michigan and once in California. It seemed likely that tracing him might prove helpful in locating Ed Julian, but he was not to be located either. About three o'clock in the afternoon, after a fruitless day of trying to locate Winters or Julian or both, I went back to my hotel room. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Now what? Uh, do you remember me, uh, the desk clerk at the Skyline? Yeah, I remember you. I must apologize for what happened. I mean, all the trouble you had with Mr. Swift and Mr. Luke. <laughs> they didn't handle the matter very well. No, they didn't. What's on your mind? Well, I'll be very blunt. Two things are on my mind. Ed Julian... And your problem in locating him. Uh, I'm just a desk clerk. I need every penny, you know. I hope you're sawing it away. Uh, I took an awful chance coming here. You asked for Mr. Julian twice yesterday. You found him neither time. Come on, get to it, will you? Well, I know you aren't a thug like those others. I mean, I, I didn't know until Mrs. Julian told me you were an insurance man. Well, anyway, I know where Mr. Julian can be found. Where? And I'd hoped you'd be able to, uh... Here. This is all I'm able to. Now, where is he? Oh, thank you, Mr. Dollar. Now, I just happened to overhear this morning when I was working the switchboard. Mr. Julian, well, he's in Salt City, California. Uh, the Salt City Smelter Company, I believe one of his enterprises. It seems he went there with a Mr. Winters because there's going to be a kind of a big meeting of all of them there. Uh, Mr. Reno and others. Uh, sometime this week. Uh, does that make sense to you, Mr. Dollar? It might... Yeah. All right, you've got your money. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, and please, please don't mention to anyone that I was here that I disclosed this to you. I'd lose my job if it got out, and I... A local filling station furnished a map of California which located a place called Salt City about 300 miles away in the desert. I decided to ask a man who might know about it, Ray Gumby, attorney at law. Uh-oh. What? I've handled correspondence from there. Not on the beaten path. Well, that doesn't tell me much. As near as I can gather, it's an enterprise town, lock, stock, and barrel. Uh-huh. Ed Julian's gone over there. 
Now, let's forget all this, at least my part of it. Why? I don't want you to go that far in trying to get him back here. Fault City's real bad news. Yeah, sounds like it, Mr. Gumby. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Why are you going this far on this case? Sounds like a loser to me. I don't know, Mr. Gumby, I don't know. But I've had the feeling ever since Ed Junior's name was first mentioned that... that something was happening. Something way off somewhere, but so close I could touch it. That's funny. I've had the same feeling. Expense account item 11, $38. Transportation. By train, San Francisco to Salt City and return. It was just coming up dawn when the conductor nudged me out of a restless sleep and told me the Salt City stop was 60 seconds long. I took my bag and stepped off onto the dry, sun-baked clay that served as a station platform. Then I looked around and saw a yellow, grimy little town stuck along one side of a yellow, grimy little mountain. The stacks from an immense smelter rising up to the skyline, the smell of phosphorus and coke in the air. It had been a bad trip to what was obviously a bad place. And naturally enough, bad things began to happen right away. Taxi, mister? Yeah, sure. Where to? Salt City Smelter Works. Know where they are? Oh, yeah, I know where they are, but I ain't taking you there. The what? Yeah, get your hand off of my cab door. Hey, look, Get your I... hand off the door. Call a cop. You better do like you say, pal. Huh? Oh, sure. Smart. You ever been here before? Nope. This is the end of the line, pal. I've been here twice. Both times I promised myself I'd never come back again. And what are you doing here now? Accident. They kicked me off their freight. I get nightmares about this place. I remember the first cop I ever met here in Salt City. While I was spelling my name to him, he hit me in the face several times. Oh, it was by mistake, of course. But don't risk any mistakes, friend. I'm not going to be here long. That's good, that's good, that's real good. You know what? What? Somebody made this dump and then forgot about it. Just plain forgot about it. I'll see you. No bird sang. No dog barked. No cock crowed. Nothing. Nothing but that feeling inside of me and something saying, it's going to happen here. It's going to happen here. Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to San Francisco. Go ahead, please. Hello. That you, Johnny? Yeah, I'm in Salt City. I'm surprised they have phones there. How does it look? Located Ed Julian yet? I just got here. It looks terrible, and I haven't even located a hotel room. Mr. Gumby, if I have any luck at all, I'll be back in San Francisco by tonight. Where's Ed Julian? I'll serve the subpoena on him if he's around. From what I've been able to pick up, there isn't much of a law enforcement agency here. You get that subpoena in his hands, and he'll have to answer to it. He's still in this county, even if they have to use state police to grab him. Okay. Anything I can do for you here? Yeah. Find out how a town like this ever got built. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Samuel Rubin and Associates Insurance Brokers Majestic Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Salt City matter. It all started when Sam Rubin asked me to bodyguard Ed Julian. Julian was supposed to be in San Francisco, but I never saw him there. I saw his wife and his lawyer and the insurance agent who had sold him the policy, but no Ed Julian. And then a clerk at his apartment told me about Salt City. He didn't tell me much else. I found the rest out for myself. I checked my bag in the station locker and walked over to the Salt City Bar and Grill. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, coffee. Just get it on the train? Yeah, a few minutes ago. Everybody calls me Connie. Everybody calls me Johnny. That's nice. Never seen you around here before. Well, I've never been around here before. Gonna stay long? I hope not. No fault of yours. 
I can't blame you. As soon as I get a steak for myself, I'm pulling out too. All kinds of funny things going on around here. Now, for instance, last week I... Oh, hello, Mr. Reno. I recognized him from the Landry killing that he'd stood trial for in Baltimore in 1950. He still looked like his pictures, tall, thin, quiet. I'd always wondered where he disappeared to after his lawyer got him off with a bought jury. My name is Jim Reno. I run this restaurant. Everything all right? Everything's fine. Oh, it's good. Good. You, uh, you ought to have some of us, too. This time of morning? <laughs> sure, just the thing. Connie, uh, why don't you go back in the kitchen and put some stew on the fire, huh? Well, Mr. Reno, I don't cook. You know that. Learn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You wouldn't be connected with the Salt City Smeller Works, would you, Mr. Reno? <laughs> I own them. With some other friend. Then you might know Ed Julian. I understand he yes, owns... Yes, yes, I know Ed. He's out there at the Smeller Works, staying in a cottage right by the office. I'll uh, call you a taxi if you like. Well, the last taxi driver I asked to drive me out there threatened to call a cop. <laughs> well, this town, it's better if I call. You know, small town. Sure. Finish your coffee, Mr. Dollar. What? I'll call the cab for you. I own the taxi company, too. Expense account item 12. Ten more cents. More coffee. While I waited for the cab to appear. Somehow I wasn't surprised that Jim Reno had been able to read my name in the coffee grounds. But by that time, I'd learned not to be surprised by anything in Salt City. Item 13, 50 cents tip the cab ride out to the smeller works was on Mr. Reno. The chimneys and stacks were dark and sullen against a gray storm-gathering sky. The only sound was a gasoline generator somewhere. Lights were on at intervals across the smoky area. One dim light burning in a little yellow cottage just inside the main gate caught my eye. No one seemed around to ask questions of me, so I walked in. Ed Julian and another man I didn't recognize were sitting in chairs opposite each other. Neither of them moved or flicked an eyelash. They just sat there, propped up, staring at each other. I got closer and decided one could get surprised in Salt City. They weren't dead. Dead men don't perspire. Dead men don't have pulses. Dead men don't breathe. They were just kind of in between. <laughs> If you ever walk into a house in Salt City and find two men just sitting in a room, quietly staring at each other, and they aren't dead, turn Johnny around Dollar. and walk out. Johnny Dollar. Don't fall down on your hands and knees and crawl around the floor like I did. <laughs> Don't start to laugh to yourself about nothing at all. Don't get weepy and perspire. And don't prop yourself up against the wall and wait for something to happen. And then, then I, I could see somebody standing beside me looking down. I couldn't move my arms and my legs, and that's pretty funny. Somebody laughed about it. Then it came to me I was doing the laughing. The noise was coming out of me. Somebody leaned down and took my gun out of my shoulder holster. He was wearing gloves and dark glasses. And then on, all at once he had a face... Easy, Dollar, easy. I'll just take this. Sure, well, sure. I know all about it. I know all about it. What, 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 is, what, what is this? What? Uh, you came to town looking for Ed Julian so you could protect him. Maybe serve a subpoena. Get him in jail. Well, Ed don't need no protecting. You can see that. He don't need no subpoena. He don't need anything, Dollar. Not now. You hear me? I hear you slipped me something at the cafe. Nah, don't you worry about that. You see, Dollar, you were just out on a regular job for Sam Rubin. But you got in a fight in Ed's place in San Francisco, bashed up a couple of his boys. You came over to Salt City looking for him. You walked in this place, and Ed was sitting here talking to Chili Winters. That, that other fellow's Chili Winters? <laughs> nah, you're getting it. Chili Winters, a big powder from the east. Bad boy. Ed didn't want you to protect him, did he, Dollar? No. No, he didn't. He didn't want to take the subpoena. No, he didn't. So you argued with him, didn't you? No. No. You I... argued with him like you did with a pair of his boys in San Francisco. You beat them up. 
Well, Chili got into the argument here now, didn't he? Chili might have pulled a gun on you. He was famous for that. I don't know what you're talking about. And you about. had to protect yourself. You just pulled out your gun and you shot them both. Like this? Oh, no, no. You... Well, Dolly, you just shot and killed Ed Julian and Chili Winters. As good a job as any bun in this town ever saw. And I saw it. <laughs> Guess I'll have to call the police. An autopsy report will show they were drugged before they were killed. And how, how are you going to explain that? We don't believe in autopsy reports in Salt City. All our police need is your gun. It won't work, you know. Now, Dollar, you know it will. You'll be arraigned, indicted, and tried right here in Salt City. It'll be second degree or self-defense, maybe. <laughs> now, if I'd have done it, or some of the boys had done it, there'd have been all kinds of trouble from San Francisco to New York. This, this is the way it was figured. This is the way. You walk right into it. Right smack into it. You, hey, you... You crazy fool, you can't do anything! He got to his feet and tried to drag me up with him, and then both of us toppled over into a lamp. And then I had the lamp base in my hand. In any other place, the next move would have been to run to the nearest police station. But from what I'd heard of the brand of law and order practice in Salt City, that wouldn't have been much help to me. Instead, I walked the three miles back to town, making my way over the crusted arroyos and cactus lands that seemed to surround it. My first stop, the Reno Bar and Grill. Oh, my. What happened to you? That's about the longest story in history. Anybody around? Just you and me, Johnny. My full name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. I came here to see Ed Julian. I saw him. Saw him shot to death. What? Now, listen to me. I saw him shot to death, along with a man named Chili Winters, about half an hour ago. Jim Reno did the shooting with my gun. I better call a Wait, wait. Now, listen to me. Remember, I came in here from the station. I made a phone call from that booth outside there. Yeah. I sat down, had some coffee, two cups. We talked. I remember. Do you remember putting anything in my coffee? Me? What are you talking about? Somebody did. Probably Reno when he came up. Now, look. You said something about wanting to get out of Salt City. Well, sure. Now's your chance. I'll get you out of here. How? You got a car? No. All right. Can you buy one for this? Three fifty, I think so. Go do it. I'll wait here for you. Well, you better not wait here. Huh? My room's across the street, second floor. Use the back stairway. I'll be there in a half hour. Expense account item 14, $350. One automobile, 1948 vintage. The waitress returned with it in exactly one half hour. In another ten minutes, the time it took her to pack two suitcases, we were on the road to San Francisco. Item 15, $18.30, gas and oil. It took us seven hours and 20 minutes to make it. Item 17, $50. I gave the waitress the car and the money, then went back to my hotel, showered, shaved, and changed clothes, and made a phone call. Who? Johnny Dollar, Inspector. You're wanted for murder in Salt City. Police all over the state are looking for you. Yeah, I thought they might be. Inspector, I'll be glad to explain all of it, but I need some time. Come on down and explain it, and then we'll see if you can have any time. Now listen to me. I was sent to Salt City to be a patsy. Reno wanted to get rid of Ed Junior and Chili Winters. Where are and he... you? Never mind. Well, you've got five minutes to get down here and turn yourself in. Otherwise, you'll go out on an APB. I got out of the hotel in about 20 seconds. A cab picked me up and I spent item 15, three bucks, transportation, getting to Ray Gumby's office at 8 Julian's Enterprises. No Ray Gumby. Item 16, eight dollars, more cab fare. This time, locating Ray Gumby's home address, an apartment over in Berkeley. He took a long time to answer. No. I don't know how he ever made it with the two holes in his neck. He lurched forward and I caught him. <coughs> Who did it, Mr. Gumby? Swifty and Luke. <coughs> you met him at Ed's apartment house. Came by about an hour ago. What's it all about? Why? Johnny. Why? Why? It was a good question. Little Ray Gumby was a dead attorney. 
And Ed Julian and Chilly Winters with Dead Gunsels. Why? Everywhere I seemed to go, people were dying hard, violently, without apparent reason. Why? I had one idea. Same old thing. The feeling. The old feeling. It didn't explain anything. It was just there. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Ellie. I've been worried to death about you. You might be even more worried when the papers come out. I'm wanted for murder. Johnny. Now listen to me. I don't have a lot of time to explain it to a policeman. I didn't kill anybody, Ellie, but I need help. Where can I meet you? If I remember right, there's a coffee shop over Are on... Are they looking for you all over town? Yeah, I suppose so. We better not pick any place like that. I have a blue Ford convertible, a 52. You know where Fisherman's Wharf is? Yeah. Go there. Watch for me. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Samuel Rubin and Associates Insurance Brokers, Majestic Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Salt City matter. Expense account item 19, 25 cents, car fare to Fisherman's Wharf. Standing there in the light rain, it occurred to me that 48 hours had gone by since I'd last closed my eyes. I might have been reading a little when Eleanor Strauber showed up. Johnny? Johnny, Johnny. Yeah. Johnny. Same old sport. What have they done to him? Oh, easy, kid, easy. Hey, look, maybe we better get out of here. Oh, yes. This way, all right? Fine, fine. Johnny, what can I do to help? Didn't I tell you on the phone I was wanted for murder? Yes. Aren't you going to ask me about that? You'll tell me if you want to, Johnny. Oh, I'm going to tell you, all right. And I want you to go to Inspector Dan Walsh at the Hall of Justice and tell him. Go on. Well, some of it you know, some of it you don't know. I know I'm the cause of a lot of it. If I hadn't been so dumb as to sell that big policy to Ed Julian... You had no way of knowing. My job was to protect him, get him alive, keep him alive until the company could break their responsibility. And I've been trying to do that. But I had to find Ed Julian first. Sure. One of my best leads was an attorney named Ray Gumby. He hoped to get Julian into custody one way or another in jail. That seemed a pretty good way for me to protect him. I got a tip from a hotel clerk that Ed was in Salt City with Jim Reno and some others. It's gone, Johnny. Well, I took the train over to Salt City with a subpoena to find Ed. He was there, all right. But Jim Reno found me first. He drugged my coffee, and when I went out to see Ed at the smelter works, the drug began to work. I saw Ed and Chili Winters. They were drugged, too. Reno came in a little while later and shot them with my gun. I got away from Reno. He was going to haul me down and let the Salt City Police charge me with murder. I think he owns the Salt City Police Force, too. I managed to get back here early this morning. I called the police and tried to explain all this here, but they wouldn't listen. I went over to see Ray Gumby. Ellie, Gumby was dying when I got there. He'd been shot twice. I don't know if the police know about him yet or not. Then I called you. Who shot Gumby? It was those two thugs I tangled with over at Ed Julian's apartment, Swifty and Luke. Only names I know them by. Reno killed Ed Julian and Chili Winters? Yeah. Anything else? Oh, no. Well, one place the police won't be looking for you is my office. There's a nice couch there. You need some rest. She drove me over to her office, and ten minutes later, I was asleep. About seven o'clock, I woke up, and for the first time in days, my head was clear. Clear enough to think of a man with a pencil mark mustache who'd sold me information about Ed Julian being in Salt City. I found him in his rooms. Oh. Yeah, we got business. What are you... Uh, hey, please, my lapel. You worry about them good and hard. I'm worried about the two men I saw murdered in cold blood in Salt City yesterday. I'm worried about the man who died in my arms early this morning. Most of all, I'm worried about myself. Please! Now, look... When you came to my hotel two days ago, you were taking a big chance about telling me where Ed Junior was. But it didn't make sense, because your kind don't take chances. What do you mean? I mean somebody paid you to look at me and tell me Julian was in Salt City. Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. Uh, uh, oh, Ed's wife didn't know he was there. The police didn't know he was there. No one but you. Now, once again, who paid you to tip me off that Ed Junior was in Salt City? Honestly, Mr. Dollar, I... 
I'm just a clerk there. It was just as I explained. I, I happened to be working the switchboard, and a call came in for Mr. Julian, and I just happened to overhear... You're lying. <laughs> Please. I was in Ed Julian's apartment. His calls don't come through your switchboard downstairs. He's got a private line. Please. Now, once more. Uh who paid you to tell me that Ed Julian was in Salt City? No one paid me. You... Who was it? He'll kill me if... Please, Mr. Dollar, he'll kill me. Who is it? Mr. Julian himself. What? Honestly, it was Mr. Julian. Before he left town two nights ago, he told Mr. Swift and Mr. Luke, all of us, to make it difficult for you and then he sent me a special delivery letter with fifty dollars in it and told me to go to you and tell you he was in salt city okay okay relax what i don't want you to make a move i just want you to stay where you are for the next half hour clear clear <laughs> expense account item 20 20 cents phone call to eleanor strober Johnny, are you all right? I'm getting better every minute. Did you talk to the police? Yes. They want to see you very badly. I'll go to see them as soon as I clear up some other business. Johnny, be careful. Don't worry about me. Did you tell them about Ray Gumby? Yes. They found his body. You have an awful lot of explaining to do. Now, look, I got another pickup for them. What? Not a body, just a hotel clerk. He's in his room at 412 Turk Street. I think he'll be out cold for another ten minutes. I just conked him. Well, Phone the police and tell him to send somebody out to pick him up. He's part of my story, and he'll tell it. But, Johnny... And tell him to be sure and pick up Swift and Luke for Gumby's killing. Got all that? I think so. See you later. Johnny, be careful. It was dark by the time I arrived at the Skyline Apartments and took the elevator to the fourth floor. The place looked quiet and deserted. It was, for the most part... Except for Lorraine Julian. She looked about the same. Tired. Sad. Johnny Dollar. Isn't that your name? Yeah. What are you doing here? Didn't you ever expect to see me again? No. You better go. Wait. You shouldn't be in here. Ed, walk in. Ed isn't going to walk in, Mrs. Julian. What do you mean? I dropped by to tell you you've been double-crossed. Where is Ed? Chilling Winters was gunned in Salt City. Ed Junior was shot to death, too. You're lying. I saw it happen, Mrs. Junior. Oh. Some kind of a trick. It isn't so. Not Ed. You haven't seen the papers or listened to the radio, then. They all have the story by now. It is true. Yeah, yeah, all of it. Ed told you to keep me guessing when I came around looking for him, right? Yeah, Sure. Maybe you didn't know, but you were helping Jim Reno put the finger on him. I don't believe you. Ed can't be dead. Neither can Chili Winters, then, huh? It was Chili they wanted out of the way. They wanted Chili out of the way. Uh huh. Well, Chili and Ed are out of the way now, and Jim Reno's in command. What a fool. What a fool I've been. I just, I'd have done anything for him. He asked me to get you, get you to go over to Salt City. I loved him. There's no way to bring him back, Lorraine. But you can help me get Jim Reno. Oh, how? Will you sign a statement? Anything. Get some paper. I wrote it while she sat there and helped me fill in the details. How Ed Julian and Jim Reno planned to get rid of Chili Winters. How Ed Julian took Chili over to Salt City with him. How before he left, he knew that Ray Gumby had a subpoena out for him and that I, if tipped off, would eventually wind up in Salt City and be a patsy for the killing of Chili Winters. Only Jim Reno decided he'd be better off if Ed and Chili were both out of the way. Do you think this will do any good? Can we get Reno for killing Ed? In a Salt City court, no. But it stands a good chance in this town. How about Gumby? Luke. And Swift. I know. Why? Mr. Gumby knew all about the Enterprises. If there had been any kind of investigation... So they just put him out of the way, huh? Yeah. Ugh, nice people. That's one trouble. You never usually ask about the people you fall in love with. You just go ahead and do it. We better find a notary public. I have to turn myself into the police. A lot of things have to be explained to them. 
I think you'd better get over to Salt City and explain some things there, Donna. Mr. Reno. Yeah. Hello, Lorraine. Those tricks. You killed Ed. Didn't this insurance man tell you that he shot him? Huh? Well, don't you worry. You got $50,000 coming to you now. You uh, want to thank him. Fifty thousand, a lot of money. Oh, you... Easy, sugar, I'm liable to blow your head off. You killed Ed. Well, I did it for this fella. I do, kid. Only room for one guy in our business, and that's me. And I figured you'd be here, Donna. You're a tough man. Come on. You and me, we're going back to Salt City. The police say I want to talk to you. I'm still your patsy, huh? You're still it, brother. They want you as bad as ever where I run things. <coughs> Don't! This thing might go off! <sighs> Don't move, Lorraine. Is he dead? No, no, I still... I'll call a doctor. Once... Once you said I look like a nice girl. I, tell me that again. Please, tell me. Yeah. A nice girl. Expense account item 21, $1,000, legal fees. To get a lawyer to explain formally what had happened. Item 22, $130, room and board. 23, 135, plane fare to Hartford and, uh... Johnny? Bye, Johnny. Bye, Ellie. The next time I sell an insurance policy, I'm going to ask for character recommendations. Then I won't get a nice fellow like you in... Johnny, will you be back? Well, I'll have to appear as witness against Jim Reno when his case comes up. Mm-hmm. Item 24, two bucks, two drinks. Yep, for Eleanor and me. Mm-hmm. Expense account total, $3,262. Remarks, none. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week, proof that a dog's life sometimes isn't so bad. A case that starts out like a lark, just one big joke, but isn't funny for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Barbara Fuller, Gene Tatum, Barbara Eiler, Lawrence Dobkin, Dick Ryan, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, Junius Matthews, and Tony Barrett. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. All right, Hearth and Homies, thanks for joining us for the Salt City Matter. Now, that show was missing episode two, but I think with the recap at episode three, you had no problem filling in uh, what happened. Now, stay tuned for the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Oh, hi, Harry. What's on your mind? I have a case for you, a very important one. Good. Tell me about it. John, did you ever hear of Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Lord, who... Say that slowly, will you? Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. Sorry, I left my kilts and bagpipes on the other side of the drink. Huh? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling real sharp this morning. But what about this Laird Douglas Douglas something or other? Uh, can you come down here to Philadelphia and see me? I hate to be so blunt about it, old boy, but what's in it for me? A nice retainer fee in any event. Well, good. And, of course, expenses and your regular commission if anything happens to Laird Douglas Douglas. Of Hedisco. Uh, why, yes. Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Oh, oh John. Yeah? Uh, come down by plane, will you? The first one you can get. Urgent, huh? Yes, John. Very. <laughs> Very. 
Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Harry Branson at the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter, whoever Laird Douglas Douglas is, and whether investigation is the proper term at this point, who knows. In any event, well... Expense account item one, twenty-two fifty, air transportation and miscellaneous, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. For a change, I decided to stay at the Benjamin Franklin, not only because it was convenient to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street, that is the office of Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, but because I'd heard it was a nice hotel. It was. And it was convenient to everything else in the center of town. Theaters, good restaurants, nice stores, even a nightclub. Well, anyhow, when I got to my room, I found a half dozen urgent messages that Harry had called. Pretty good indication that his lordship, Douglas Douglas, of, or at least this case, was pretty important. So instead of bothering to unpack, I had the bellboy dump my luggage, tipped him, and was standing there debating whether I'd better forego a quick shower and change of clothes when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. John, didn't you get my messages? Why haven't you called? I've been waiting to hear from you. What's wrong? Hey, take it easy, Harry. I just this minute got in. Oh. Well, I hope you're coming right on over here to my office. Well, what's the matter? Something happened to this client of yours? No, not yet. But being you, you're expecting the worst, huh? And look, you still haven't told me a thing about this emergency or whatever you want to call it. John, it is an emergency because of the time element. You see, oh, why do we waste time on the phone? Well, this was your call, not mine. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I'll be waiting for you. And Harry, I'll be there. <laughs> Still knowing nothing whatsoever about what was going on, I decided I'd better be prepared for anything. So I slipped the 38 cold out of my bag and took it along. Expense account item two, 65 cents, cab fare. I've said it before when I handled the Amerigo case for him, Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a worry wart. So I kind of hoped he was making the usual mountain out of the usual molehill this time. However, when my cab pulled up in front of his office building, he was standing waiting on the sidewalk out front. Hey, I keep the change. Thank you, sir. John, John, what took you so long? Huh? Thank goodness you're here. Harry, what are you doing out here? Lose your office or just forget the key? I almost wish I had. John, we have a problem. A serious one. Yeah, with Laird Douglas, Douglas of, uh... Heatherscote, Heatherscote. He's up in my office yeah, now. Sounds like international intrigue. Has Scotland declared war on us or something? This is no time for levity. He's up in the office now, and you must take over immediately. This is a very serious situation. Come. Okay. Oh, now, what's it all about? Has Laird Douglas died and... Oh, no, no, you said he was up in your office. And I'm sure you don't mean just his body. Yes, he's there with Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Kelly Van... Huh? Are you kidding? I certainly am not. You see, she insists that you act as his bodyguard. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for you... 13th floor, please. Yes, sir. Unfortunately... I said 13th floor operator. Please, quickly. Yes, sir. So, Harry? And for... Young man, will you please start this elevator immediately? Gotta wait for the signal, sir. Signal? This is an emergency. Take off! Immediately! Emergency? Yes, it involves Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, well, sure, if it's... Who? Good man, good man. <sighs> okay. Now, you were saying, Harry... Was I? Uh, unfortunately, something. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Fortunately for you, she was quite cognizant of the fact... Who was cognizant? Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. She knew about the excellent work you did for us in connection with the Ricardo Amerigo case not long ago. Excellent detective work, she called it. Thirteenth floor. You remember the case, Ricardo, the concert violinist who disappeared, presumably. Yeah, murdered. I remember. And your almost intuitive deduction that he wasn't dead at all, but had merely staged the whole thing to make it uh, look as the... Harry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Thirteenth floor. You mean uh, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van... Excuse me, mister, but I'm getting signals from the other floors. You're quite right, you should. As I started to say, John, she is one of our biggest personal policy holders. Good, good, but uh, hadn't we better get into your office and meet her? Oh, yes, yes, but I want you to know about the personal premiums. Alone, they run to something over $20,000 a year. Mr. Please. Well, she is an important client. Yes, yes, and that's why I Mr. didn't, William, I didn't hesitate to accede to her request that you be called in on this case. 
I called you, and here you are. Mister, please. Hmm? Oh, well, get us up to the... Th oh, oh, we're here. Why didn't you tell us? Come, John. Mister, if I was to tell you what I'd like to, I... My office is right this way, John. Come, please. Hey, look, you better calm down, Harry, and give me the dope on this case right from the beginning. Yes, yes, I'd better. All right. Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is a very important client, has been for years. So you said. But there are a lot of things you haven't said, like, uh, what has she got to do with this Laird Douglas character, and why is he so important? It's this way, John. The policy on him runs to $5,000. No double indemnity, which is good. As a matter of fact, the policy on him was purely a favor to Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. You know, considering such short life expectancy and all. No, I don't know. Is he in his dotage or something? Well, hardly. Or are you being facetious again? But you said... Hey, how old is he? His birthday is next month, May 7th to be exact. He'll be four years old. Hip four? That's right. Short life expectancy? Of course. You see, John... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah, uh, some horrible disease or something, huh? What's the matter with him? John, you wanted this from the beginning, so I'll give it to you from the beginning. Okay, but Harry, If it you're... hadn't been for Mrs. Van Pyten's own policies totaling something in the neighborhood of half a million, uh, more in fact, Harry. why we'd never have written the one on Lord Douglas Douglas of Heather's Code. So, now we've cleared that up. Harry, we passed your office three or four doors ago. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yeah. But uh, as I'm sure you understand, I wanted to give you some of the background before you talk with Mrs. Van Pyten. After all, you asked for it. Yes, yes, I guess I did. But uh, what you've given me so far has landed me smack dab in the Department of Utter Confusion. And I'm beginning to think maybe I have company. Oh, where? Who? Right here. You, Harry. Now, look. Why don't we quietly stroll into your office and let me get the whole thing from Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten herself? Or better still, from Laird Douglas Douglas. But you couldn't. Of course not. What? At least not from him. Why not? John... Will you please stop joking? Who's joking? This is serious business, very. <sighs> Look, Harry. Yes? There is one thing I'd like to talk over before we go in to see him. Them, somebody. Yes? Yeah? Well, apparently the life and or welfare of this Laird Douglas Douglas is in danger. Oh, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. I thought I'd made that very clear to you. Yeah, well, you said you've written only a $5,000 policy on him. That's right, $5,000. And purely yeah, as a... Yeah, 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 I know all about that. Now, look, I don't want to seem crass about it, Harry, but my commission, if anything were to happen to him, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Which is precisely why I told you you will be paid a retainer while you're on the case. A most generous one. A generous one? By you? By Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. How much? Well, John, now mind you, this may not require your services for more than a week or so. As bodyguard, that is. How much? And, of course, she has authorized an expense account. Ah. But, mind you, John, not the usual kind that you seem to have the knack of piling up beyond all reason. Clearly, a completely honest, legitimate accounting... Harry, that how much? But as a matter of cold fact, I have assured her that it will total no more than the amount of the retainer she is prepared to pay you. Any more than that, and, uh, well, you'll have a lot of explaining to do. Harry, how much is this retainer to be, if I take the case? I might even go so far. $750 per week, or a fraction thereof, and I am sure you will agree that that... What's the matter, John? Seven fifty a week, plus expenses, when there's only a $5,000 policy involved? That's right. But if this four-year-old Laird Douglas Douglas of... of, of, of Heather Scott. Yeah, if he's only worth a $5,000 policy... And what was that crack about short life expectancy? John, I told you he is already four years old. He... Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes. No, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Van Pyten. I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute there. No, thereafter. I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Laird Douglas Douglas... How have this code? Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. <clears throat> Here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long. You really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. 
Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all, he is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you, and I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Oh, good, he's awake. Oh, no. That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hey, oh, John! Hey, Douglas, Douglas, Mary, no! Somebody. Let go of Mr. Dollar's leg! Douglas, dear! Douglas! Johnny Dollar. Ray Rowland, Johnny. Oh, hi, Ray. Just got your message. What are you doing in Philadelphia? Oh, a case for Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, and I may need your help. What do you know about Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Why, he's one of Scotland's finest. Wait a minute. That's your case? Yep. Insurance? And bodyguard. How's about lunch? Johnny, have you met the... Have you met his lairdship? Yeah, and I nearly lost a leg doing it. Oh. And you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, shut up. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, in connection with my investigation, or rather my involvement in the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And I wish I'd had some idea of what I was getting into before I ever left Hartford. But it's too late now. <laughs> Expense account item three, thirty-nine fifty. One pair of slacks. For within a few minutes of my arrival in Philadelphia, Harry Branson of Philly Mutual buttonholed me and dragged me up to his office to meet two important clients he had. First was Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I am so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me, and I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. And then came... Well, Mrs. Van Pyten made the introduction. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, no. Oh, oh, holy oh, jumping... Douglas, Douglas! Oh, no, you mustn't do that. Oh, my. Douglas, oh, dear, good heavens. Get on oh, your own Douglas, chair, Harry. This no, one's taken. No. Sorry, John. Sorry. Down, Douglas. Down. Oh. There, dear. That's the boy. That's a nice boy. That yes, is now. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope? Yes, isn't he adorable? He's so playful. He was really just playing, you know. There, dear. Come now. Harry. Yes, John? This is the client you call me all the way down from Hartford to see? Yes, John. Yes, 750 a week, practically unlimited. At expense account. Oh, dear, just look at your trousers, Mr. Dollar. I don't need to, thanks. I can feel the draft. But you need new ones. Here. And I insist you let me pay for it. Down, oh, oh, Douglas, oh, oh, oh. down. Here, Mr. Dollar. Will a hundred dollars be enough? Uh, she. No, here, a hundred and fifty. I can see those were very, very nice ones. Well, uh, you see what I mean, John? Here, please. Now, I insist you take it. And if it isn't no, enough... No, 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 thanks. That's plenty. But now, Harry, you listen to John, me. John, I know what you're going to say, but as I explained to you on the way up you here to my office... You explained plenty, but not nearly enough. But I tried. I really I tried. I think you and I had better have a quiet little talk, Harry, and the sooner the better. Oh, boys, please, can't you do that another time? Please come down from those chairs so Mr. Dollar can meet Douglas and we can make all the arrangements. Please? Mrs. Van Pyten, that's precisely what I want to talk about. <laughs> you really look very funny up there. And see, Douglas does want so much to be friends with you. Yeah, you're sure it isn't a piece of my leg he wants. Oh, no, of course not. Here, Mr. Dollar, just give him one of these biscuits. I have them specially baked for him. And he'll be your friend for life. Really? Huh? 
Here, now just come down and hand it to him. Well, He'll love you. It's true, Jot, I know. Yeah? Then what are you doing up on that chair? I, I forgot, that's all. Nice, Douglas. Huh? Please, Mr. Dollar. Well, hey, oh, all I hope is he doesn't forget. That's right. Just hand it and to him. And then he knows which is biscuit and which is my hand. <laughs> Yo, uh, here, boy. Here, boy. Now, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, oh, oh. There you see. Now he's your friend. Well, Isn't that sweet? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Well, well, I'd better get back to my hotel and change it. Harry, I'll call you. Oh, but we haven't made the definite arrangements yet. And I want you staying out at our place in Germantown, the Maples. It's a lovely little place, Mr. Dollar. Well, much as I hate to say it, I'm, I'm not quite sure about taking oh, this Oh, I know. The money. Well, don't you worry about it. Not at all, not one bit. If you'd rather have a thousand dollars a week, that's what we'll make it. And I do wish Mrs. you'd let Van me Pyton. do more about these poor trousers. I know. Why don't you go straight over to Wanamaker's men's store and have them tailor you a whole suit? Wouldn't that be nice? You'd look lovely. You've already given me more than enough oh, to buy a suit. that. Now, just forget it. Now, you have them make you anything you want and just charge it to me. Oh, and look. Douglas Deer is licking your hand. I knew he'd like you. Never underestimate the power of a woman, somebody once said. Or maybe they should have said never underestimate the power of a fast buck or a thousand bucks. Anyhow, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyton had set her heart on my handling this whole affair, and she simply wasn't to be denied. Couple that with a chance to pick up enough loot in a few days to, uh... Well, what would you do? And the darn mutt did take a liking to me. So, with Laird Douglas Douglas in my lap... Oh, he's a Scotty, by the way. A Scottish Terrier, Mr. Dollar. If you'll pardon my correcting you. Sorry. And it's all because of the show at Bala Kinwid on Friday. Bala where? Uh, B-A-L-A-C-Y-N-W-I-D, John. Yes, Bala Kinwid. Laird Douglas Douglas simply must win. Not only best of class, but best of show. And he will if somebody doesn't interfere. Oh, you uh, you think somebody might uh, might do something to, to uh, Douglas? Here? I'm sure of it, because it's been tried before. You mean poison him or something like that? Worse. Oh? Dope. Poison would let him die a hero, a martyr. But drugs would keep him from winning the show. Oh, I... Well, what makes you suspect somebody might try it? As I said, it's been tried before. Huh? Last year and again a few days ago. And if Harrison R. Kenworthy thinks he can do it again, he's mistaken. Then you know who did it before. I refuse to divulge any names. But you just said... Mr. Dollar, I will not tell you. All I ask is that you watch over Laird Douglas Douglas until he has won the show. Oh, and if he does win, as I'm sure he will, I'll insist that you accept a nice bonus. So you can see, I'm very, very serious. And so it went on for another half hour or so. And finally she left, after I'd promised to pick up my bags at the hotel and move out to her joint in fashionable Germantown. I talked a few minutes longer with Harry Branson. I'm so glad you've agreed to take this on, John. As I told you, Mrs. Van Pyten is the most important individual policyholder we have, and doing this favor Harry, for us... Harry, it's not the Mutt Show at Bala Kinwood or Laird Douglas or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten or you I'm doing this for. It's purely love of the green stuff. Whew. That old dame must be really loaded. John, she has so much money. She, well, she doesn't know how much she has. Industrial empire, that sort of thing. All right, all right. But Harry, if word ever gets around in the trade that I came down here to play bodyguard to a mutt, so help me, I'll have your head. <clears throat> yes. Uh, but now hadn't you better go on out to the Maples? Well, first I want to know about this Harrison R. Kenworthy she mentioned. Oh, that. Yeah, that. She accused him of doping up her Scotty. Well, she really doesn't know. And it, it's really quite complicated. How do you mean? Kenworthy owns a beautiful Kerry Blue Terrier, Lady O'Diddy's Roll of My Mane. Lady O... Holy cats, and no pun. Why can't they give an honest dog an honest name? Look, we'll call her Mimi. Go ahead. Hi, dog lovers. Ray, just in time. Meet Harry Branson, Ray Rowland. Oh, we know each other. Hello, Harry boy. Mr. Rowland. Sure, Harry called me in last year when these two dogs were at each other's Of course, throat. he doesn't mean that literally, John. You see, Mr. Rowland is quite an authority on show animals. I've held it against him for years, ever since school. Well, there's no need to hold it against him. And I don't mean that literally. Oh. Well, John Boy, so you came down to help yourself to a handful of dear Mrs. Kelly Van Pyton's coin. More power to you. I knew Harry would call you in on the case. Felt it in my bones. 
And, brother, you may be in deeper than you think. Oh, what's that supposed to mean, Ray? Has Harry told you about the villain of the piece, Harrison R. Kenworthy? I was just starting to when you so rudely... Yeah, well, Johnny, the whole setup is a riot, but just remember one thing. Yeah? A lot of people have been killed in riots. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I'll tell you what he means. Let me tell it, Harry. It would take you all day. Sorry, no offense. All right. Go ahead, Ray. Okay. Bella Kinwit is the biggest event of the year in the doggy set. Okay? Okay. All right. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten owns Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherskull. Real fine Scotty. Yeah, good tea, see? Hey, those pants are really gone. Anyhow, Harrison Kenworthy owns Lady O'Diddy's Rolamar Meme, Carrie Blue. Mimi. Huh? I'd get indigestion trying to say that other name. Okay, Mimi. They're two pretty good dogs, especially Mimi, international championship blood and all that. But Mimi's the better dog. Douglas won't stand a chance. I've tried to tell her this, but... Well, go on, go on. Okay. Harrison Kenworthy loves Kelly Van Pyten, see? Oh, loves her money. Him? He's loaded, too. No, I think the old coot really loves her, and I think she loves him. Right, Harry? Yes, I think I'm inclined to... Right, but now get this. Yeah? She won't marry him until her Laird Douglas beats his Lady O'Diddy, uh, uh, Mimi, yeah. far and squar at the Balakinwood show. How do you like that? Are you kidding? Oh, no, John, it's an accepted fact. Right, that so what happens for over a wait year Wait a minute, now, Ray, wait a minute. If he really wants to marry her, why doesn't he just let her dog beat his? And let her be one up on him right from the start? Never. No, boy, he'd never live it down. You don't know these people. Well, this is about the craziest thing I ever heard of. To you and me, sure, but to them it's deadly serious. Are they in love with each other or with their dogs? Well, it's not just love where the dogs are concerned, but pride, which is just about all a lot of these old, lonely millionaires have to think about, to live for. Yea, sometimes even unto the fifth and sixth generation. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. But now she said something about her dog being doped at the show last year. Oh, yes, John. You see, it was just a couple of days. Right, just before the finals. It was an attempt to murder the dog with poison. But emergency care both times pulled Lair Douglas through. She told me it was only some kind of a dope that oh, was used. Oh, sure, sure. We kept the truth from her. You don't realize it, boy, but if that dog were to die, she would. Fact. Oh, now, Ray. Oh, yes, John, and the insurance company must keep that dog alive in order to obviate having to pay off... Right. After all, her policies amount to... Right. (laughs) It may sound absurd to you, Johnny, but it's no joke. As I said, you don't know these people. But look, it still doesn't make any sense. You just have to take my word for it, and it's happened right here in Philadelphia. Yes, John, and we held the policy. It was an old lady... Right, so there you have it. (sighs) Okay, okay, I'll, I'll believe you. And so the finger points at Harrison R. Kenway. Well, she might like to think that, uh, especially since she doesn't know that poison was used both times, but I don't. What's more, the police feel the same. Oh, now, if you say police dogs, I'll slug you. John, there are times when this sense right, of humor Harry, of yours... Right, Harry, dead right, and I do mean dead. No, in all seriousness, Johnny, if I were you, I'd duck out of this assignment. Now, don't say that, Ray, unless John no, is... No, 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 go, go ahead and say it. Something ought to start to make sense around here. All right, listen. The reason I'm sure Harrison R. Kenworthy had nothing to do with the attempted poisonings, the reason the police were called in, the reason I think you ought to get get out of this... get to the point, Ray? On each occasion, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten had a bodyguard attending Laird Douglas, in addition to the dog's governess and medicos and so on. Get to the point. Each time, in order for the poisoner to get to that dog... Ray, please. Each time, the bodyguard was murdered. Still want this case, Johnny? Johnny Deller. Lieutenant Steve Howard, homicide. I found word to call you there at your hotel. Right. I'm an insurance investigator, Lieutenant, and... Yeah, I've heard of you. Uh, can I help you? Well, I understand you're the man who handled a murder case at the Bala Kinwood dog show last year. That's right. Uh, we're still working on it. Oh, fine. Like to look over the setup for an attempted murder? Oh? Uh-huh. Who? Me. Stay right there, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat matter. And at this point, that name is no joke. Expense account item three, 70 cents, cab fare, from the office of Harry Branson to my hotel. It was at Harry's office that I got the craziest assignment I'd ever taken. Bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat, who turned out to be a dog. And I mean that literally. A purebred Scottish terrier who rated high enough and dogged him for somebody to make a couple of attempts on his life. Right now, it looked like somebody wanted me to be next. Uh, what's all this talk about an attempt on your life? Here, Lieutenant. 
Take a look at this handbag of mine. Huh? Wait, don't touch it. Huh? I left it here on this little luggage stand about an hour ago, right after I checked in. Only before I left it, I opened it and took out my gun. So? So when I got back, just before I called you, I found the bag as you see it now, locked again. Well, now look here, Mr. Yeah, I know, I know. But if a chambermaid had been in here, there would have been other signs. You know, bed turned down, fresh towels in the bath, things like that. Boy, you're a suspicious man. You sure you didn't lock it yourself after taking your gun I'm out? sure. Anyhow, instead of opening it, I started to pick it up to put it on the bed to unpack. Here now, you lift it. Why? Because it weighs close to 25 pounds, and that's too much for nothing but an extra suit, a few shirts and shorts, some handkerchiefs and the like. You check with the desk? No callers that they know about. Well, let me see. Yeah, that is pretty heavy. And it doesn't tick. Now, look here. Yeah? You see where somebody on the fire escape used a pry bar to shove this window open? Oh, yeah. And those marks are fresh. Very fresh. Operator, get me central police. Expense account item four. Check for twenty-nine fifty to the nearest Bond clothing store for one pair of trousers to replace those torn by Laird Douglas Douglas of what's his name when I'd first met him in Harry's office. Item five phone call to Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Well, don't you worry, Mr. Dollar. If you're delayed, you're delayed, and we'll just expect you here at the Maples when you get here. Your suite is all ready and waiting for you. I'll be there as soon as I can. Oh, I do hope you've had a suit made to replace those trousers little Laird Douglas tore. Why don't you have a couple of suits made and just charge them to me? Thanks. Maybe I'll get around to that. Goodbye, Mrs. Van Pyten. First of all, I had to know what Lieutenant Howard found out about the suitcase he'd had his lab crew pick up. I took a taxi to headquarters. That's item eight, 65 cents. Why, well, glad to see you, Dollar. Sit down. Well, what'd you find out? Dollar, that bag of yours had enough soup in it to blow out half the side of your hotel. Oh, then I was right. Yeah, professional job, too. Straight wire rig that would have gone off when you opened the bag. Brother, I guess my lucky star is in the ascendant. <sighs> what made you suspect a booby trap, Dollar? Last year and a few days ago, somebody tried to poison a dog. Well do I know. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat, Blue Ribbon Scotty, belonging to Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly. Kelly Van Pyten, yeah. Right. Apparently, the whole reason for it was to keep the pooch from winning the best of show at the annual dog festival, or whatever you want to call it, out at Balakinwood. So I've heard. I think it was more than that. Oh, wait a minute. Now, don't tell me you subscribe to the idea that if the dog were to die, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten would probably kick off, too. No question about it. <sighs> okay. Well, you don't know her yet. You wouldn't be so skeptical. Her whole life revolves about that dog. And her money, of course. Now, from what I've seen, she just throws that away. Of course she does. At least in small quantities. You know, a thousand or two here or there, even a hundred thousand to some school or library or something where it'll show. But even that's only a drop in the bucket to her. Lieutenant, I don't quite see what you're driving at. Well, she is one of the remnants of a class in this country, fast dying out, thank goodness. That for generations has been cultured and conditioned into thinking that money is everything. That their whole destiny is to control vast industries, lands, railroads, oil, shipping, and people. People, Dollar, by means of their sheer financial prowess. But I thought our present tax Yeah, situation... sure, their day is almost done. But the few who are still around, like Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, are hanging on for dear life, trying to add to their power. <laughs> hey, Steve, you make a sweet, gabby, eccentric old lady sound like an ogre. She is, no question. I'm sure she doesn't realize it. Simply because this whole attitude has been so thoroughly ingrained into her all her life? That's right. Oh, well, we'll see. Yeah, you'll see. Well, look, let's get to the point. Who do you think might be trying to get rid of the old lady? I haven't the least idea. Well, uh, no family? Relatives? Only living relative is her nephew, Warren Staley. Ah. Nothing. You sure? I haven't been able to pin a thing on him. Where can I find this Warren Staley? At the Maples. He lives there with her, huh? Yep. And you're sure he would be her only beneficiary? Yep. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Good luck, Dollar. Lieutenant Howard seemed to know what he was talking about. Nonetheless, I decided that the nephew, Warren Staley, would at least be a start. And the sooner I could move in at the Maples, the better. Item 9, 780, cab fares, back to my hotel and out to the Maples in the suburb of Germantown. When I first saw the place, I could hardly believe my eyes. It looked like a regular castle perched atop a small hill. Even the gatehouse, nearly half a mile from the mansion, was big enough to house several families. 
But the mansion itself, wow. A rather stuffy-looking butler, after practically climbing up my family tree, escorted me to the reading room. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, and guess who? <laughs> Whoops! Oh, easy now, Doug. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you're here. And look, he remembers you. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, it is. Yeah, a boy, Doug. Easy oh, now. and please call him Douglas. Huh? After all, the name Doug sounds so common, doesn't it? Oh, you really think he cares, Mrs. Van Pyten? Uh, oh, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah. Mr. Branson said you had quite a sense of humor. Yeah, now, did Hastings show you to your suite? The butler? No, but he took my things. Then I'll show you. I'm sure you'll love it and be quite comfortable. This way, please. Yes. Uh, you coming, Doug? Uh, Douglas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Attaboy. Attaboy. <laughs> Do you see how happy he is having you here? I am too, Mr. Dollar. Now we just... Oh, Warren, darling. Huh? Hello, Santa. Mr. Dollar, this is my little nephew, Warren Staley. Warren was 25 or so, bright, good-looking, and well, but comfortably dressed. And at Mrs. Van Pyten's orders, he took me up to my suite... Living room, study, breakfast room, bath, and bedroom. And it's still occupied only a small part of the second floor. Now, here next to you are Dougie's rooms. Wow. One for sleeping and one for eating. Can you tie that? The dining room for a dog. And uh, through that door is Mademoiselle Poirot, his uh, governess. She feeds and bathes them. And that's a full-time job? Oh, sure. Most pampered dog in the country. Brother, I'll go with you on that. No doubt Tonto will ask you to keep this connecting door open at night. Hey, sit down a minute, Warren. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. I hope you're impressed by all this. Are you kidding? <laughs> Tonto will love you dearly. Say, would you like a drink? There's a cellarette here for your convenience. Holy. Sure. Scotch and soda. Good. Rather foolish, though, isn't it? All of it. What do you mean? Oh, it's such nonsense to keep up in a state like this just to keep face, so to speak. Well, she can afford it, can't she? Are you kidding? You sound as though you don't enjoy this life of luxury. Yeah, here's your drink. Enforced luxury to keep up the honor of the family. And I resent it. Oh. Without ever having to lift a finger, do an honest day's work. When she's gone, I'll be one of the wealthiest men in the country. That's bad, huh? Do you think it's strange that a fellow would like to stand on his own feet for a change, make something of himself, buy himself? Well, why not just pack up and leave? <laughs> you don't know Tata. No, I guess I don't. Oh, it's really more than that. I'm the only member of this family left, aside from Tata. So I understand. I'm the only one left to carry on the Van Pyten Empire. They drink up. Wait a minute. Branson used that term, too. <sighs> yes, empire. Not only enough security to sink a battleship, but controlling rights in steel, utilities, and most important of all, East Moreland oil. I see. And what's most important about that is that I'll survive to keep control of East Moreland from Kenworthy. Harris and R. Kenworthy. Yeah. There's been a battle over East Moorland oil for, for generations between the Van Pytons and the Kenworthys. Say, tell me, does Kenworthy have any heirs? One. His son, Ronald. I see. What sort of a fellow was he? <laughs> Good friend of mine. We waste a lot of our time together. Oh, uh, drink up, Mr. Dollar. I'm ready for another, and you haven't even touched yours. Yeah, well, listen. I'm going to lay some cards on the table. Shoot. Sure. Somebody's been trying to get at Laird Douglas, the dog, presumably as a way of getting at your aunt. It's true. If anything were to happen to little Dougie... Okay, okay. I'll take your word for it. Now, because of the intense rivalry between your aunt and Kenworthy, or rather between Laird Douglas and his pup, Lady Odidi's Mimi, or whatever her name is, anyway, Kenworthy should be number one suspect. When you know him, you'll cross him off your list. So Lieutenant Howard has told me. <sighs> but, uh... Go on. All right. All right. As sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten Empire, as you call it, you come in as fast number two on the list. I can understand that. But unless everything you've told me is a fancy fairy tale to throw me off, then... Every... Everything I've told you is... It's true, Mr. Dollar. Hey, what's the matter with you? <sighs> Nothing. Go on. Okay. And mind you, Warren, I'm not forgetting for a minute that there's been a couple of murders involved in this whole screwy business. Plus an attempt on my own life. Attempt on... On you... Dollar? Hey, hey, what gives you... <laughs> Are you plastering on a little over one no, drink? No, listen to me. I know. Now I know, and I can tell you, Dollar. Tell me what? The answer, the, the whole thing. Dollar! Warren, what's the matter with you? I can't... I can't breathe. Hey, you... Warren! A, a drink meant for you. 
Don't touch. He died without another sound. I carefully sniffed the drink that had been poured for me, gingerly tasted it. Nothing. Nothing that I could spot. Yeah, poor Warren had probably been right. Whatever it was had no doubt been meant for me. Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Howard, homicide. Oh, hi, Steve. Hi. As you know, I've given orders for you to be confined to your suite out there at the Maples until I can get some of the lab crew out there. You don't think I murdered Warren Staley? Apparently, you were the only one who was with him when he died. Now, look here. I'm the one who's kept even the family out of here. What's more important, you're the only one on the whole estate who might be trusted to keep things intact. Any possible evidence. So please, don't leave your room. Okay, diplomat. I'll sit tight. Expense account, or rather report, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in connection with my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. No need to itemize expenses at this point, because there are none. The magnificent suite in which I'm parked out at the sumptuous mansion of Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is fine. Except for the body of young Warren Staley, Mrs. Van Pyten's nephew, draped over the arm of the easy chair in which he died a few minutes ago. I'd called Lieutenant Howard at homicide on the phone in my room immediately, and within minutes, the nearest patrol man was stationed outside my door, refusing admittance even to the lady of the house. After all, this was the third murder that tied up with the Scottish terrier who started all this, Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. While waiting for Lieutenant Howard and his crew, I shaved, showered, and changed my clothes. Then, about ten minutes later... Well, Dollar. Yeah, Lieutenant. Ah. See what you mean. Yeah. He seemed like a nice kid, too. He's all yours, Doctor. Go right ahead. Very well, Lieutenant. Here, Paul, just sit like you do. Okay, for pictures, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead, Sergeant. Okay, excuse me, Doc. Before you get started... Okay, Dollar, let's have it. What happened? Well, Warren brought me up here himself, and I sat him down to ask him some questions. You suspected him, didn't you, in spite of what I told you? Sure. As sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten estate, empire as he called it. Yeah, well, what do you think now? That you were right, that he was clean. Anyhow... My boy, my boy, darling Warren, where is he? No, take your hands off me. My boy Just a minute, Mr. Van Pyten. You... No, you can't keep me out. This well, is my own house, and this is my own yes, nephew, I, I'm my sorry, boy. but you'll have to wait until we can get oh, everything clear. Oh, this terrible, I'm terrible thing. Mrs. Van Pyten, you just wait until we finish Just this. a minute, Lieutenant. Hey, whoa, young fella, hold on a minute. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, who are you? Ronald Kenworthy, his best friend. What happened to him? He was Poisoned? Poisoned? And where were you? How could a thing like this happen if oh, you were doing... Oh, what... Ronnie, just calm down a minute. How long have you been here in the house? Why, half, three quarters of an hour, something like that. But I don't where? see... Where? Where were you? Well, I was down in the reading room with Mrs. Van Pyten. All the time? Len, out in the garden. Alone? Yes, except for a few minutes while I talked to Hastings, the butler, out there. What were you doing in the garden? I was on my way up here by the back way to see Warren. I've always used the back staircase from the garden ever since we were kids together. This suite of rooms used to be our playroom, ever since I can remember. All right, all right. Go on with what you were saying. Well, then about that time, or a few minutes later, I don't know exactly, I heard the police car come screaming up the driveway. That was the first that any of us, Mrs. Van Pyten or Hastings or I, that any of us knew that something was wrong, that something had happened to Warren. But now look here, Mr. Dollar, right, I don't... with you two. What? You'll have to leave with Mrs. Van Pyten until we're thrown here. Oh, please, Ronald, help me. Help well, me. but I... Go ahead, Ronnie, go ahead. Oh. All right. Oh, come on, you poor old Ah, oh, poor old dame. Sorry for her. Yeah. You finding anything, Doc? Yes, I think so. I certainly think so. Be with you in a minute. All right. You better go on with what you were saying, Dollar. Well, not much more to say, Lieutenant. Warren felt the same way you do, that Branson at the insurance company does. If anything happened to the dog, Laird Douglas, it'd be the end of Mrs. Van Pyten. That the murders of the dog's handlers, caretakers, were purely incidental to attempts on the dog's life. But... But what? Well, he apparently was as concerned over this whole thing as we've been. Said he had a very strong theory about who might be back of all this. Who, oh, did he tell you? He was about to, and this, whatever it was, hit him. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what it was, Lieutenant. Yeah, Doc. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh yeah, Mr. Doc. Dollar. Norfolk acid. Same thing that killed the two dog handlers and was used on the dog itself. I can tell without further examination... Wait a minute, I... Doc. Wait a minute. 
If the dog got the same thing that killed a couple of grown men... A dog with a much more sensitive stomach, unused to all the strong food and drinks the human stomach is constantly abused with, a dog would immediately regurgitate and retain only a minute amount of the panorphic acid. I see. In the case of Warren Staley here, it was added to the scotch whiskey he drank. Traces of it in his glass and in a full glass beside your chair. Well, Doc, have you checked those bottles in the cellar? I uh, just about to. Uh, uh, which uh, bottle did he pour that out of, Dolly? The one right next to that bottle of VO there. He... Wait a minute. This isn't the same bottle. What? Well, the one he poured from was half empty. This is nearly full. Hey, now, what's the matter with you boys? What's up? You let somebody switch bottles a minute ago. Oh, Now, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Nobody else came in here besides Mrs. Van Peyton and young Kenworthy? Hastings the butler, but he just stood in the doorway. That's right, Lieutenant. Yet somehow, between the time Warren Staley poured those drinks and now, somebody switched bottles. Unless you're wrong about this, Dollar. No sign of the poison in this one, Lieutenant. It's the only scotch bottle. You've been here in the room all this time, Dollar? Yeah, sure. And in the bath, I shaved and showered and dressed while waiting for you to get here. But only after one of your men came and parked outside the door. Well, where does this door lead to? Well, it's the dog's quarters. Two rooms. Oh, I see. Come on, Dollar. You might wait for us. Yeah, I'll be here. What about that door beyond? Oh, that. Mademoiselle Poirot, the dog's governess. Well, where was she? How should I know? I didn't even meet her. Oh, no, oh. Louis! Louis! Ah, the Folies Bergeur. Yeah, I, I guess I should have knocked. Who are you? Why are you coming this way while I'm dressed myself? Uh, uh, sorry, Mademoiselle. We're the police. Police? What have I done that you should see me this way? Well, nothing, ma'am. Nothing. But, but how long have you been there in your room? Only two minutes. I came in the back way to change my clothes. Yeah, that was obvious. It's my day off. I have big day. Well, not now you haven't. Get dressed and I'll send an officer in to escort you downstairs. Come on, darling. No, you cannot do this to me. I've done nothing wrong. You cannot make me stay here. Say, Pete, yeah. send somebody around the back way to cover the governess and take her downstairs yeah. for questioning. Yes, sir. Hey, Ransom. Yo. And Johnny. Looks like you goofed. Hmm? While you were showering, somebody came in through her room, through the dog's quarters, and did the bottle switch on us. Oh, well, then we're even. Yeah, we're... What? You have very carefully mussed up any fingerprints that might have been on those doorknobs. Oh. Uh, Jerry, see if you can get any prints off those doorknobs back there. All right. If I haven't wrecked them. But Johnny... If I didn't know about you and your reputation, I'd peg this on you so fast, you'd... You haven't been holding out on me, have you? I assured him that I hadn't, then went downstairs to the monstrous living room and sat in while we went through a routine questioning of everyone in the household. I even went through the motions of bodyguarding the dog that had started all this and tried to console Mrs. Van Pyten. Results of the questioning... Nothing, Dollar, nothing. No leads. Yeah, so I noticed. The two previous murders of the dog's caretakers, or bodyguards, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, well, same poison was used then. In their food as well as the dog's. But why? Why, Steve? Why? Why they? To keep them from helping Laird Douglas when it hit him? Well, more likely because those handlers had got wind of the attempt to poison the dog and suspected who was trying to do it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So there's one thing you're overlooking, Dollar. What's that? The intended victim of this last poisoning was not Warren Staley, but you. Oh, brother, I'm not overlooking that for one second. Yeah, and that's why I asked you if you were holding out anything on me. Because it would indicate that you have a lead. Or at least suspicion about someone. Sure, sure, I got a lot of suspicions. Ronald Kenworthy, his old man, the butler, heaven help us. Even Mrs. Van Pyten. <laughs> Maybe even you, Steve. But when it comes to evidence... Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, I've got work to do. Looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack was nothing compared to hunting for the poison bottle of scotch that was no doubt stashed away somewhere. Far, far into the night, a regular army of policemen probed and dug and poked around. They opened drawers and closets and cabinets, pounded on walls, looking for sliding panels and secret compartments, went through the trash, sifted a trash heap, dug up any freshly turned earth they could find on the grounds, even climbed trees. Yeah, they prowled through attics and basements, looked everywhere. Result? Nothing. Meanwhile, I stayed close to Mrs. Van Pyten, and I'll say this for her, 
In spite of her almost silly infatuation with that dog, she showed real strength of character. We sat alone together in the reading room. I know, Mr. Dollar, there's nothing I can do to bring Warren back. Therefore, there's no point in simply sitting here weeping over it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it isn't easy because it meant more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, uh, I want to ask you some things, Mrs. Van Pyten. I suppose this is the wrong <coughs> time, but I... No, ask me, Mr. Dollar. I think I know what you want to ask, and now... Now that this last terrible thing has happened, I hope, I, I pray that I can help you. Well, I had quite a talk with Warren before he died. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm glad. Warren would have been the sole heir to the Van Pyten estate. Yes, he alone would have carried the honor, the prestige of the family after my passing. Oh, no. Surely you didn't think that he could have been behind those other terrible murders. Quite frankly, at first I did. But he told me something else, and it's bothered me. About Mr. Kenworthy and his son. Ronald? Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. He was supposed to be Warren's best friend. You said supposed to be. Well, I... I Warren don't... made it very clear that if the Kenworthys could somehow acquire the Van Pyten holdings, either by Mr. Kenworthy marrying you... I have told Harrison R. Kenworthy... Yes, I know. If Laird Douglas wins the show from his Kerry Blue Terrier, you'll marry him. Yes. And I still think it's a screwy idea. But the fact remains it's fairly true. It's quite true. Neither you nor Mr. Kenworthy has too many years ahead, if you'll forgive me. Mr. Dollar, what... So there's now only one person left to benefit by the death of Laird Douglas, of Warren, of you, and ultimately of Mr. Kenworthy. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. That's right. Ronald Kenworthy. Well? I know. I know it. I think you've said enough, Mr. Dollar. Ronald! Yes, I heard it all. Mr. Dollar, I think you said too much for... Shall we say your health? Johnny Dollar. Ronald Kenworthy, Mr. Dollar. Good. I want to talk to you. Are you at your home? I am. And after the Okay, then stay right there and I'll be over to see you. Why don't you send the police instead? What's that supposed to mean? A few minutes ago in Mrs. Van Pyten's library, before you kicked me out, you practically accused me of the murder of her nephew. Did I? Well, didn't you? Didn't you? All right, Ronnie, just calm down and stay put until I can get over there. <laughs> you mean you aren't afraid I might try to take a powder, as you high-handed detectives like to put it? You mean you aren't worried that... Uh. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is the final report in my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heather's Skull matter. The whole case started out almost as a lark when I discovered that I'd come to Philadelphia to act as bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas and for a fat fee and virtually unlimited expense accounts. Me, bodyguard to a dog. But it ceased to be funny when I learned that the dog's two previous caretakers had been murdered and when, only a few hours ago, an attempt was made on my life that ended with the death of young Warren Staley. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I see. I guess I was so upset by the death of my nephew that I I didn't realize the attempt was really made on your life. The second attempt, Mrs. Van Pyten. What? Shortly after I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody planted a booby trap in my suitcase in my hotel room. Good heavens, no. And you think that Ronald Kenworthy did that, too? Well, what do you think? Well, yes... Now that poor dear Warren is gone, there's nothing to prevent the Kenworthy estate from achieving control of the Van Pyten holdings. That is, if I were to die. Go on. Upon the death of Harrison Kenworthy, the whole financial empire would be inherited by his son, Ronald. So I understand. Ronald. And he would be the wealthiest, the most powerful man financially in the United States. Ronald, who pretended to be Warren's best friend who pretended to love me. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Apparently adds up, though, doesn't it? There is no question of it. But what evidence have you? None yet. Well, then I'll help you get it. And I can do it, Mr. Dollar. 
I may appear to be only a wealthy, foolish old woman who dotes on her pet, Laird Douglas. But I'm not. I'm astute, shrewd, and clever. Since Peter, my husband, died, I alone have managed this estate, this financial empire. I use the word again. With my money, with my... Oh, yes, I can do it, Mr. Dollar, and Ronald will be made to pay for these terrible things that he has done. I, uh, I admire your confidence. Nothing. No one can stand in my way. You'll see. I'm only sorry that a few minutes ago you didn't keep him here, make him face it. I'm going to see him now. Oh, where? At his home. I understand the estate adjoins this one. Yes. But please, look out for him. Shoot first, Mr. Dollar. What? Because now he may act like the cornered rat that he is. I decided to walk across to the Kenworthy estate in the hope the fresh air would help clear my thoughts. Logical as it all seemed, I didn't like what I just heard. Then luck, pure, unadulterated luck. As I walked across the broad lawn between the main house and the gatehouse, I passed the garage building with its Rolls Royce, two Cadillacs, and a station wagon. And then I saw him. Andy LaFord, alias Andrew Fortune, alias Andrew Ford, one of the cleverest second-story men in the country, with a record on the West Coast as long as your arm. A man who would do anything for money. He was idly going through the motion of dusting off a car. I walked past quickly, not sure whether he'd notice me or not. I hope not. For it was one of his ilk who'd had to plant the booby trap in my hotel room, who could have slipped the poison into the liquor that killed Warren Staley. I turned in at the gatekeeper's house. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I saw you at the question. I want to telephone quick. Uh, well, yeah, uh, right here, sir. It's something Thanks. wrong. Thanks. Oh. Operator, get me central police emergency. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Something The man there in the garage polishing cars. Uh, Andy? How long has he been here? Oh, a year more, ever since the dog show at Valley Kid. Well, what does he do? Year. Oh, the driving for Mrs. Van Payton, but there's something gone. Hello, to... give me Lieutenant Howard, homicide. <laughs> After warning the old gatekeeper that I'd have his head if he said anything to anyone about my phone call, I left by the back door and went over to the Kenworthy mansion where young Ronald was waiting for me. I must say, before we go any further, that I resent the way you ordered me out of the Van Pyten house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Whether you suspect me or expect me to help you in this case, it was Lonnie, hardly... you knew Warren Staley. Very well. We were the closest of friends. Confidence. All right. Just how much did he really care about the Van Pyten estate? Fortune, whatever you want to call it. To put it bluntly, he wanted none of it. And I'm afraid his aunt rather resented it. Well, why do you say that? Because her whole life, she's been obsessed by an almost overwhelming lust for power... When Warren finally rebelled against this, she tried not to show it, but she hated him for it. Unlike my father. Oh? I feel as Warren felt. And my father and I together have been laying the groundwork for dissipating the Kenworthy estate into corporate setups that will benefit many instead of just us. Does that sound strange to you? Well, it sounds like true philanthropy, if you mean it. You must believe me, it is, and I do mean it. Oh, I won't suffer, of course. I'll still retain some control here and there, but I'll have to work at it instead of just carrying on the tradition of the idle rich. I'll be a man. I hope you're telling me the truth, Ronnie. I believe you are, and I'd like to meet your father. You will. Needless to say, it was much harder for him to break from this tradition of financial power than for me. So perhaps you can see why I admire him above all other men. Anything else? I'll see you later. I was worried about you, Mr. Dollar, going over there to see Ronald Kenworthy alone after all that has happened. Yes, you should have been, Mrs. Van Pyten. Especially if you noticed that I passed by the garage on the way. What? I happened to notice someone there, and I think it answered a lot of questions for me. It was Andy LaForte. Andrew? My private chauffeur? Is that all he is? Oh, do you know him, Mr. Dollar? Look... I took on this case, Mrs. Van Pyten, because you offered me a fee too good to be turned down and an almost unlimited expense account. You haven't answered my... I should have got wise then and there. But I thought your great passion for your dog was just an amusing foible of an immensely wealthy, kind of foolish old lady. Oh, Laird Douglas is a dear one, isn't he? Why, Mr. Dollar... Let me add things up. A few minutes ago, you told me that thanks to your wealth and a very sharp, clever mind, you'd let nothing stand in the way of anything you chose to do. Please, Mr. Dollar, I don't think I understand. All right. You made a contract with Harrison Kenworthy that you'd marry him when and if Laird Douglas beat that puff of his at the dog show. 
An apparently silly sort of thing, yet everybody believed it. But the real reason for marriage to him was solely to acquire control of his holdings, increase this financial empire of yours. Very subtle. Kept you looking like a cute, whimsical old lady. Why, this is the most absurd thing I ever heard of. So I thought at first, but let me go on. Oh, please do. When you realized that Laird Douglas wasn't ready to beat that dog of his, rather than admit defeat, rather than lose the chance to make this marriage, you ordered the murder of the dog's handlers. <gasps> then the contract was still in force, just delayed. I won't listen to such terrible things. You'll listen whether you like it or not. You learned that Kenworthy and his son were planning to dissipate their fortune and thereby put it beyond your reach. Mr. On top Dollar. of this, your own nephew, Warren, wanted to do the same with your estate. This was too much. What you have said is too much. Then, by the time I arrive, you learned from an expert, Ray Rowland, that your dog would never stand a chance against Kenworthy's. So you wouldn't dare let him compete, at least until you'd hooked Kenworthy some other way. And part of your whole scheme was to build up evidence of attempts against you, through the dog, of course, though I'll bet you actually hate the mutt. No, that's not true. Anyhow, from the moment I talked to Ray Rowland, I was only in the way. So you tried to get rid of me. Had somebody booby-trap my luggage. Oh, you have no proof. Andy LaForte, this so-called chauffeur of yours, would do anything for money. And I fully intend to break him down and make him admit you hired him as a killer. Listen. Listen to me. On the second try, the poison liquor, your nephew Warren got it instead of me. Fine, fine. Another obstacle out of your way. After all, he had opposed you. Mr. Dollar, how much do you want? I can make you financially independent. Then you the set your sights on Ronald Kenworthy, who was trying to break up the other empire you wanted to get your hands on. You even hoped that somehow I might help you. Shoot first, you said. You don't understand. I was Just only... what plans you had for his old man and that warped, twisted brain of yours, I don't know. But I'm sure you had plans. Well, lady, now it's too late. No, Mr. Dollar. No, it isn't too late. Stay away from that drawer. You'd even shoot somebody down with your own hand if you thought it necessary, wouldn't you? But it isn't necessary, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Are you sure it wouldn't be easier if I were just to give you... Say, a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand. All right, Andrew. Right here, Mrs. Van Pike. Well, well. Hello, Andy. Got a license for that thing? Shut up. You want me to do it now, Mrs. Van? Yes, Andrew. Uh, what if the servants hit a shot? Hold it, Donna. Don't worry, Andrew. I'll take care of things. Haven't I always for you? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. She'll take care of things. While you're pulling that trigger, she'll blast you down so fast you won't know what hit you. Make it look like we killed each other and leave her in the clear. Quiet. She's got a gun in that drawer beside her and she'll use it. You hear me, Eddie? I said quiet. What you don't know is that she can't do without me. <laughs> but we can do without you. All right, Andy, wait now. Listen, will now, you? Now, Mrs. Van. All right, Andrew. Now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Oh, Lieutenant. Then you saw he was going to shoot down Mr. Dollar. Yes, I oh, heard yes. too, Mrs. Van Pyten. Plenty. Oh, no, you, you don't understand. Mr. Dollar had come up here to talk to me. I wanted to offer him a great deal more money for his work for me. I guess didn't I almost I, didn't Dollar, make it. I'm glad you keep talking said, to him so long. Got a cough drop. Is this body the end of the fortune? Oh, shut the up. What was that? You heard him. I beg your pardon. Clever, shrewd, astute. You're just off your rocker. You'd have to be, I guess, to start a thing like this in the first place. Well, I guess by the time the estate and inheritance laws get properly applied, the Van Pyten Empire will be spread around the way Warren wanted it. Expense account item 10, $28.90. Fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total, including fees, $1,113.40. Remarks? I'm glad I'm poor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, an insurance swindle that really backfired. The only trouble was it caught me right in the line of fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. 
Heard in our cast were Jeanette Nolan, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Jack Crucian, Bill James, James McCallion, Ken Christie, Dick Ryan, Bert Holland, Jack Edwards, and Hi Everback. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. All right. That was another great Johnny Dollar episode. Now, don't go anywhere, because up next, we've got Bob Bailey in The Shepherd Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Providence, Rhode Island, calling. Mr. Dollar? Yes. One moment, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Dick Porter. I'd like to hire you. Porter? Uh, Dick Porter. I'm an insurance broker here. Bert Masterson at United Adjustment Bureau suggested I contact you. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Porter? <laughs> well, darned if I know exactly. I just have a client who's taking out all the insurance he can get. I may be wrong, but it looks to me like he's getting ready to die. Oh. Can you help me out? I can try, Mr. Porter. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item one, $15. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Providence. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and was in my hotel room by 3.15. At 5 o'clock, I was having a quiet drink with Porter, who turned out to be a 24-year man in the insurance brokerage business and seemed to know what he was about. I've never had anything like this happen to me, and I didn't quite know what to do about it. I'm glad I can get some expert advice from you. Well, I don't know how expert the advice will be, but I'll do what I can for you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Want another one of these? No, I'm fine for now, thank you. I'll try to explain this matter as far as I know. Two days ago, Dr. Shepard called me up and inquired about rates on straight life insurance. Mm -hmm. He's carried about $20,000 worth of policies, so 10 years or better. Um, I have the figures in my office. Mm Mm-hmm. I gave him the prices for coverage, and he said he'd take $80,000, which would bring him up to an even $100,000. Now, Shepard's a single man. The beneficiary on his other policies is his mother, Claire Shepard. She lives over in Pawtucket. He's only dependent. He wants to name her beneficiary again. I see. Now, where do matters stand with Dr. Shepard right now? I told him it'd take a few days to draw the policies up. He sent me a check for the first payment and told me to do what had to be done. I don't want to act on his application until I know it's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, what can you tell me about Dr. Shepard? Very little. He seems to have a good practice here in town and does his share of charity work and so on. As far as I know, he's above question. Would have to be, of course, to practice medicine here. He has an apartment above his offices, owns a building, all of his equipment. Know anything about his friends? No. Now, let me understand this about Dr. Shepard. He called you. You didn't call him. He wanted to buy the insurance. Uh, You didn't try to sell it. That's about it, yes. And that's why I'm worried. Give me a hundred people and I'll show you 99 out of that hundred who will never, never call up an insurance broker and say, I want to buy some life insurance. Yeah. People have to be sold life insurance. They'll go out and shop around for fire, theft coverage, automobile insurance, health, almost any kind. But straight life insurance, that has to be sold. On the other hand, suppose Shepard is that one in a hundred. Yeah, yeah, it may be a perfectly legitimate situation. Yeah, Shepard may have looked into his mirror one night and said to himself, I gotta have $100,000 worth of insurance or I won't sleep a wink. Oh, yeah, it could have happened that way, Mr. Porter. But uh, I have to think of those 99 people in that hundred. Sure. Sure, so do I. Well, here's to caution. Cheers. Expense account item two, $25. Deposit on a rented car, which I use the following day, driving from place to place, collecting data on Dr. Charles Shepard, M.D. At his bank, I was able to learn that he enjoyed what might be called a lucrative practice, and that, like most people, he spent slightly more than he made. He belonged to a golf club where he was seldom seen. He belonged to a tennis club, which he managed to make three or four times a week. 
Questioning the pharmacist who had the prescription counter a half block from Dr. Shepard's building and the manager of a cafeteria across the street from same, I was unable to learn who Dr. Shepard's steady companions were or gain any information that would justify his puzzling application for life insurance. Hello? Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, please. Do you have an appointment? No, I don't. Well, may I have your name, please? Johnny Dollar. 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 Are you a regular patient of Dr. Shepard's, Mr. Dollar? No, no, I'm not. I didn't think I recalled your name. I've been with Dr. Shepard almost five years. Uh, Who recommended Dr. Shepard? No one. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid doctor's out now and won't be back until... Late this afternoon. Well, now, that's funny. I was standing out in front of you three minutes ago, and I thought I saw Dr. Shepard walk in. Please, Mr. Dollar, he is not in to anyone. What's your name? Why, I'm Miss Streeter. Miss Streeter. Well, yes, but I... I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, Miss Streeter. Here. Oh. Insurance investigator? Yes. Will you tell the doctor that? Please? I... Yes, I... I'm sorry, I had to tell your doctor was out. He asked me to say that to everyone who came in. I'm afraid the doctor's been acting strangely all day. I'm very much concerned over him. Excuse me. The tall, pale, brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced on a wan, unprofessional smile, and looked like she wanted to cry just before she disappeared beyond the reception room to seek out Dr. Shepard. I pretended not to notice that part. One minute passed, two minutes, three minutes. No one reappeared. So I pushed the door open and I looked down the corridor leading to the examination rooms and laboratory. I had to notice Dr. Charles Shepard standing at the end of the corridor. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat, stethoscope in one hand. But in the other hand, he brandished a thirty-two automatic. And the safety was off. Stay where you are, mister, and get your hands up. pocket do you keep your credentials in? Left inside. I'll get them. Insurance investigator. For whom? At the moment, for Mr. Porter. Dick? Yeah. Well, here, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I... I guess I'm very nervous these days. Oh, uh, well... Mr. Dollar, I'd like to get your address and phone number before uh, you... That's all right, Green. Uh, Uh, Don't you think this might be a good time to go out and get a bite? Well, it's a little early, Doctor. I have some lab tests. Go ahead, Corinne, like a good girl, and uh, lock up, huh? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Yeah, goodbye. Very fine girl, Corinne. She's been with me... Five years, she told me. Oh. (laughs) I don't know how I'm going to explain meeting you in the hallway with this in my hand. Uh, yes. Well, uh, before you try, suppose you snap the safety on. Oh, yes. I, I look somewhat foolish, I guess. You want to come in my office? Sure. You say Mr. Porter sent Mr. You. Porter told me you made an application for $80,000 worth of life insurance. We, uh, we look into things like that, Doctor. Investigate me because I want to buy life insurance? Yeah, yeah. You're a single man with few responsibilities? Well, I don't know whether to be irritated or not. Am I I going to get my insurance? I wouldn't be irritated, Doctor. Put yourself in the insurance company's position. They're just not used to this kind of application. Oh, you you may get it, I don't know. But obviously you're in some kind of trouble, gun and all. Well, I... You know, the whole thing is a ridiculous mess. Mr. Dollar, my life has been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies... I suppose I've been acting very strangely lately. I I don't know whether to leave town or give up my practice. All you have to do is pick up that telephone and call the police and tell them about it. A threat in your life comes under police business, Doctor. I know that, and I would go to the police, only... Well, it's a very delicate matter. I have a patient's welfare to think of. You can't very well treat any patient if you're dead. I suppose you sit down and tell me all about it. All right. Several months ago, I treated a woman named Forbes... A thorough examination and consultation disclosed that her poor physical condition was not based on any organic disorder, but rather upon her own emotional instability. Not an uncommon diagnosis this hectic day and age. 
You've heard of things like this, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I've heard of semantics and neurotics and psychotics, but I'm not a doctor. Well, let me tell you the psychotherapeutic side of medicine is by far the most challenging, and one in which I've had considerable experience. Consequently, I undertook to treat Mrs. Forbes, hoping to effect a cure. Are you a psychiatrist, doctor? No, I am not. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Dollar. In the process of treating Mrs. Forbes' physical ailments, I urged her to recount a variety of experiences, talk to her from day to day, probing all the while for the source of her trouble. It has been my intention from the first to place her in the hands of a competent neurologist. I suspected her trouble early in the treatment. She's married to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Paul Forbes. Oh. I made a grave error when Mrs. Forbes pressed me last week to... Well, I could only tell her to move out and divorce him immediately. That's pretty extreme advice, Doctor. I know, but I also know the advice was right. Oh, you aren't in sympathy with me, I can see, but let me tell you that any competent psychiatrist would have advised her the same. I approached her husband on the matter a few days ago. What? I explained to him that Mrs. Forbes' health, her very life, is in jeopardy, that more is involved here than just keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. And Mr. Forbes doesn't care for semantics. He doesn't care for Mrs. Forbes, Mr. Dollar. He ranted and raved and accused me of trying to break up his home, and finally he attacked me. I managed to get away. Did he threaten you then? Yes, he said he'd kill me. Who else was there? What do you mean? Who heard him say these things? Why, Mrs. Forbes was there and a servant in their home. Yes, a servant. Upton's his name, I believe. You should have called the police. I should have done a lot of things differently in my lifetime, but I didn't call the police. My prime Mary concern is for Mrs. Forbes. Further shock and guilt complex could be totally disastrous to her. So are you going to creep around here with a gun in your hand? I don't know whether I'd even know how to use it. I... I... Now, why the application for all the insurance? Well, I, I wondered if Forbes might get me. I wanted to be sure my mother was taken care of. I... I don't know whether anyone's ever threatened your life, and you knew for certain he'd try to carry out the threat, but that is the position I am in. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll think of something, but what about my insurance? That's up to Mr. Porter. If what you say is true, I wouldn't insure you. What do you mean, if it's true? Of course it's true. Doctor, I don't believe it. I left him standing there in the corridor, staring after me. A lonely man. Somehow not as frightened a man as he tried to let me believe. I wondered about that. I was still wondering about it when I went to sleep that night. Johnny Dollar. Dick Porter, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Did you check on Dr. Shepard? Yeah. Uh, do I write up his policies? Well, that's up to you, Mr. Porter. Dr. Shepard's life has been threatened. What? That's according to him. And the man who threatened his life has definite homicidal tendencies, also according to Dr. Shepard. Well, I... I... Well, what do you think? Porter, I think Dr. Shepard's a liar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepard matter. More expenses, item three, 26 cents, one bottle of aspirin for Mr. Porter. I felt he was going to need it. I hope you aren't trying to be funny, Mr. Dollar. I'm not, Mr. Porter. I think you've got a tough decision to make. I, uh, I know that the commission on $80,000 worth of insurance would be high. Uh, uh, sit down. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Porter, Dr. Shepard told me he bought or tried to buy all that insurance because he thought a man named Forbes was going to kill him. He bought it, he said, to make certain his mother is well provided for. He was carrying a thirty-two Colt. Hmm. Now, he spoke of treating Forbes' wife and of advising her that divorce would settle her health problem. Mr. Forbes didn't like that and accused Shepard of trying to wreck his home, and, well, that's about it. Now, what have we got? <laughs> Well, your Dr. Shepard is either nuts or an idiot or the cleverest man alive. I don't know. I do know I believed about one half of what he told me. Maybe less. Well, what reason would he have to lie? Beats me. If someone threatened your life or mine, we'd turn to the police for help. Now, Shepard won't do that. Insists that it would probably be hazardous in the case of his patient, Mrs. Forbes. Well, I don't want to write up this policy if what he says is true. 
But I, I don't want to pass up the commission if it isn't true. Can you stick around town for another day or two and find out about it? I'll do what I can, Mr. Porter. Go ahead. Have an aspirin. He had an aspirin and I had a car ride. Once again, out to the offices of Dr. Shepard. The same things were more or less going on in the same way. His nurse, Miss Streeter, appeared as distraught as ever when she recognized me. There was a quick dabbing at the eyes, a straightening of the hair before she spoke. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Hello. I'd like to see the doctor again. He was calling Mr. Porter's office trying to locate you. I'll buzz him. Mr. Dollar, do you have anything to do with why doctor's been carrying a gun? No. That's his business. In other words, I should mind my business. Well, I'm being honest. I've advised him what to do on the matter. What matter? He'll have to explain that to you, Miss Streeter. It doesn't make much sense to me. You can go back now. Okay, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Doctor. You were pretty insulting yesterday. I'm sorry about that, but we both have a problem to solve. And I get paid sometimes for deliberately insulting people. <laughs> You're a stranger. You want to change your story about all this? I wish I could change it. It's still a mess, a bad mess. I thought it all out last night, and I still must hold to my original thinking. I have to place my concern for my patient, Mrs. Forbes, before anything else. In other words, you won't call the police and tell them your life's been threatened. No, and you're very stubborn about that part. I don't think you comprehend the situation at all. Look, wait a minute. Let's understand each other, Doctor. If this man Forbes is all you say he is, and you say you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, then the best thing for you to do is to prefer charges against him for threatening your life and have him locked up. Now, you could do that. According to what you've told me about Mrs. Forbes and a servant in their home witnessing his threats... I will try to explain again. I can't do that for Mrs. Forbes' sake. I just can't. She's been through a shattering ordeal. I must attempt to resolve this quietly. Now, true, I can generally anticipate a man's actions inside my office under clinical conditions, but I... Well, Forbes is different. That's why I tried to contact you today. Someone like you could approach Forbes and possibly persuade him to discard his ideas of violence. Probably do it in a quiet way, too. What does Mr. Porter pay you? Well, what's that got to do with it? I'm willing to pay you. I mean, you and I don't seem to get along very well, but I phone Porter and he tells me you're one of the best men in your line of business. I'll pay you to go to Paul Forbes and talk to him as I've described. <laughs> I can't figure you, Doctor. Now, let you and I not get into any personality arguments. Will you do this for me for your regular fee? I was going to do it anyhow. For Mr. Porter and the fee, he pays me. I just wanted to check you first. I'll do it. But I still think it's a matter for the police. All right, let's leave it this way. You go talk to Forbes. If you think he means to kill me, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. Patient or no patient. How's that? That sounds a little more sensible, Doctor. I took down the home address of Paul Forbes and climbed to my rented car and drove over to his home in the gilded edge of the city. A story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. Lawns, trees, Plymouth convertible, a push-button station wagon in the garage. It was a nice warm spring day and some flowers were blooming and smelling up the area in a very nice way. Flies buzzed, bees droned, birds sang. And I went up and pressed the doorbell. I should have gone butterfly catching or taken a plane to Spokane. Yeah? I'm looking for Paul Forbes. Does he live here? Yeah, he sure does. I'm Forbes. Mr. Forbes, my name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Yeah, and I came over to talk to you... You get out of my way! You fool! The front of his gun snapped against the side of my head and I went down to my knees. A door slammed somewhere and someone ran away. I twisted around trying to see what it was all about. And then I managed to get to my feet in time to see Paul Forbes plunging the Plymouth out the driveway and heading I don't know where. Oh, oh. My goodness, my goodness. What happened here? Uh, Where's Mr. Forbes? You hurt? Yeah, I'll be... Oh, Miss Forbes, Miss Forbes. Hey. Oh, let me help you, sir. Yeah, give me your arm. Yeah. We better sit you down over here. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks. my goodness, my goodness. Goodness gracious, sir. How did this happen? Mr. Forbes swung a gun at me. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Oh, no, sir. No, easy, sir. Easy, easy. Nice, nice. Know, let's sit down here. Oh. What happened here? I'm afraid Mr. Forbes attacked this gentleman, Miss Forbes. Call the doctor up and then go to my medicine chest and get some swabs and a pan of cold oh, water. Right away, man. Uh, the doctor isn't necessary. It just made me dizzy. You're so. cut. It might be deep. Well, get the first aid things and some brandy, Upton. Right away, ma'am. This is unforgivable. Just 
unforgivable conduct. Please, I don't know who you are. Are you a friend of Paul's? No, I'm Johnny Dollar. I, I wanted to discuss with your husband something. I, I take it you're Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Oh, Upton, uh, set them right here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You feeling a little better, sir? I, I don't know yet. Hey, let me try some of that. Yes, yeah, certainly, sir. Certainly. There we go, sir. Easy now. Easy. <laughs> Thanks. How does it look to you, Upton? Well, I believe it's not too deep, Mrs. Forbes. How's it feel, Mr. Dollar? No, I, I don't think it's very deep. I'll be all right in a minute. Upton, go telephone Dr. Shepard and tell him to come over here immediately. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how sorry I am for this. You, you can bring suit against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. Paul's temper is just ungovernable these days. He could have killed you. He took the car and ran. Yeah. I don't know what's gotten into it. Two nights ago, he attacked my personal physician, threatened to kill him, and now he's attacked you for no reason at all. Any idea where he might have gone? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. He's mad. <laughs> Pauline Forbes had a right to be scared from what I'd seen of her and from what I'd seen of her husband. He was an angry man with a gun in his hand, slugging at anyone in sight. She was a distraught woman with a darkening spot underneath her right eye, and it wasn't mascara. I began to wonder who needed more looking after, Dr. Shepard, Mrs. Forbes, or Johnny Dollar. Now, you just lie still now, sir. Uh, well, I guess you kind of fainted a little bit. Is there anything I can get you, sir? No, no, uh... Just tell me about Mr. Forbes. I beg your pardon, sir? Look, I'm an insurance investigator. I came here today to talk to Mr. Forbes about threatening Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't want to talk out of turn, sir. You you better discuss that with Mr. Forbes. Now, just one question. Did Mr. Forbes threaten Dr. Shepard's life? Yes, sir. You heard him? I did, sir. He attacked Dr. Shepard here two nights ago. Did he also attack Mrs. Forbes? Mr. Dollar... This is an unhappy house. Things have gone all wrong here these last few months. Mr. Forbes changed. Mr. Forbes, uh, well, I don't know. I, but please don't ask me to speak up against anyone. I'm just trying to find out the best thing to do for everybody concerned. What can you do, sir? Well, I didn't think anything like this would happen. It's terrible, Doctor. Terrible. This about settles it. Now, I want you to go up to your room and lie down. There's no sense in your getting any more excited. I want to see about Mr. Dollar first. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Upton. Uh, let's have a look at this dollar. Uh, get that light. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How is it? Well, I don't think it's anything worse than a cut. How do you feel, dollar? Oh, an aspirin might straighten me out. I hope so. After? Uh, yes, I'll get some, sir. <laughs> dollar, I should have taken your advice yesterday. I'm going to take it now. I'm going to call the police and have this man arrested. He might kill somebody next time. Yeah, am I all right? Sit up. <sighs> Dizzy? Yeah, a little. That'll wear off. What will they do to Paul? Well, they'll take him into custody and probably talk some sense to him. Oh, this, this is awful. You go up to your room now, Mrs. Forbes. We'll handle this. Oh, Upton, uh, take Mrs. Forbes upstairs. Yes, sir. You just come along, Mrs. Forbes. Thank you. Yeah... She is not a well woman. She looks all right to me. I wish she were. Uh, I want to get an x-ray on that head. Can you come by the office this afternoon? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, give me the police. I doubt if it's concussion or anything like that, but it's best to play safe. You're a safe player all the time, aren't you, doctor? What does that mean? I don't know. Now, look here. I'm not... G Hello? Uh, yes. I want to talk to somebody about a threat on my life. I... My name is Shepard, Dr. Charles Shepard. When I left him, he was reporting Paul Forbes to the police. He gave them Forbes' description and the license number of the Plymouth Forbes was driving. I didn't stay beyond that. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should never have left that house. I'm not sure, but if I hadn't left, I might have saved a life. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. 
This is Miss Streeter at Dr. Shepard's office. Yes? Dr. Shepard gave me your hotel number. He said you were to come in for a head x-ray. Let me talk to the doctor about that. Well, he's out on house calls right now, Mr. Dollar. He'll be back late this afternoon. He seemed very concerned over... He ought to be. A friend of his banged me on the head with a gun this morning. That's why the x-ray. Well, could you possibly come in and have it made? Doctor was most insistent. (sighs) All right, Miss Streeter. I'll be right over. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepard matter. Expense account item four, one dollar, cab fare, from my hotel to Richard Porter's office. Porter was sympathetic. You know, I feel very responsible for this, Mr. Dollar. I hired you to look into all this. Oh, it'll go away, it'll go away. I've been hit on the head before. Hey, do you have anything to drink in here? Oh, sure, sure. (laughs) You never can tell when a snake will come up and bite you. Yeah, Yeah, here you are. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I suppose you came in to give me your expense sheet now that it's all settled. Not exactly, Mr. Porter. It isn't settled for me. Certainly, you know I'll assume any medical expenses involved here. No, I'm not talking about that, Mr. Porter. Sit down. Now, look, there's something going on here, and we might as well have it out. You hired me to investigate a client who wanted to buy $80,000 worth of straight life insurance, right? Yes. Now, that client explained why he called for that insurance. Not to my satisfaction, but he explained it. He said a man named Paul Forbes had threatened his life. Threatened it because Dr. Shepard had advised Forbes' wife to get a divorce. I know you didn't believe this, but the facts now seem to bear it out. I went over to see Forbes this morning to talk to him about his threats. I managed to get my name out, and Forbes attacked me, so I got this. Then Forbes ran out. Mrs. Forbes and a servant in the house gave me first aid. All the time they were doing it, they were apologizing for Forbes and his violence. Finally, Dr. Shepard came in, called the police, and told them to pick up Forbes. And the police will pick him up if they haven't already, and Dr. Shepard will prefer charges... And that that won't be that, Mr. Porter. Not as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Shepard's story is still leaky. I'm sorry, but I think it has more credence than ever in view of what's happened. You told me yourself his wife and the servant admitted Forbes had threatened Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, I believe that part. But Shepard lies so much, you can get to believing him. What lies, for heaven's sake? Oh, for one thing, his reason for not calling the police right away. I mean, about how delicate Mrs. Forbes' condition was. She looked pretty healthy to me this morning. Another thing, he described Forbes as a man with homicidal tendencies. Now, Dr. Shepard's supposed to be an expert on behavior. And he thought that if I talked to Forbes, I might settle the matter peaceably. But Forbes attacked me as soon as I told him my name. I didn't get a chance to talk. Well, Dr. Shepard has no control over... He felt pretty sure I could talk to Forbes. If you don't like that, let me go on. What reason did Forbes have to hit me? He didn't know me from a load of coal. Somebody put him up to it. Who? Who do you think? Shepard, for some reason? Shepard was the only one who knew I was going right over there. But why? I don't know. What would he gain? Mm, My business for an x-ray. You're joking now. I suppose I am, but I got a headache. I feel off. Oh, here. Uh... How about Mrs. Forbes? Oh, here. Thanks. Oh, she seemed like a genuine enough person. Not sick the way I expected her to be. Someone slugged her recently. There was a bruise under one eye. Mm, Shepard said her husband was an erratic, ruthless, violent man. Well, look, I'm stubborn, Mr. Porter. I still think Shepard's been lying to me. If for no other reason than I think I know the breed. What's all this got to do with the insurance application? Well, that's another thing I don't know. Expense account item five, three dollars, cab fare, to Dr. Shepard's one-story building to have my head x-rayed. Shepard was still out, but Miss Streeter did the honors, almost in silence. Outside of sit still and hold it, nothing much was said. Well, the picture's okay, Mr. Dollar. I looked at it. I didn't see anything wrong. Of course, the doctor will call you when he's had a chance to see it. Swell. You must have got quite a blow. That's a nasty bruise you have. Oh, it's pretty good, all right. He swung his gun hard. Well, the doctor will be back about mid-afternoon. He can call you at your hotel? Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. I want to ask you a question, Miss Streeter. Yes? Are you in love with him? What? Are you in love with Dr. Shepard? Well, that's rather my own business, isn't it? Unless, of course, in your investigation of whatever you're investigating, for some reason I'm under your scrutiny. Well, I suppose it is, and I suppose I can take that to say yes. i become rather angry with you, Mr. Dollar, but frankly, you seem rather ridiculous. I suppose so. He's a liar, isn't he? I mean, Shepard. One more question. I told you on the phone a friend of Dr. Shepard's did this to my head. Now, did you ever ask me who that friend was? 
Well, I think you'd be curious about a thing like that, Miss Streeter. I think I have a great deal of work to do, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, another three bucks, some more cab fare. This time back to my hotel where I picked up my rented car, filled it with gasoline, item seven, five dollars and thirty cents, and drove out to Pawtucket. At the home of Mrs. Clara Shepard, I explained my name and business to an elderly man who answered the door. He asked me to wait a moment, then returned and said Mrs. Shepard would see me. She was a bright-looking, gray-haired woman in her mid-sixties, elegantly groomed and obviously well cared for. We went through the politenesses, then got down to business. My son applied for eighty thousand dollars worth of life insurance and named me beneficiary. That's about it. <laughs> I wonder what he's up to. So do we. You mean so do I? You don't trust anyone, do you, Mister Dollar? He said his life had been threatened. He told me he wanted to make certain you were well taken care of in case anything happened to him. Oh. He was lying, wasn't he? I haven't seen him, talked to him. Even had a Christmas card from him in three years. Maybe he does worry about his poor old mother now and then. I'm flattered. Well, what you're saying about him isn't very flattering. Oh, I don't think Charles ever thought much of me as a mother. Still doesn't. I'm sorry to admit. But then I don't think too much of him as a son. So there we are. Is it too early for a cocktail, Mister Dollar? How do you explain him already having a twenty thousand dollar policy on himself and wanting to kick it up to a hundred? You, the beneficiary. No explanation. That's why I suggested a cocktail. To my friends here, Charles is a successful doctor in Providence who calls me faithfully every day, sends me gifts, and is always assured that I am well and happy and occupied in my old age. I guess I like you, Mister Dollar. Perhaps because, with all your gruffness, you might be nice to your mother. No, Charles and I aren't close. Never have been. I can tell you this: I don't need his closeness, at least, not in a financial way. If Charles were to die and I received a hundred thousand dollars, it would mean a rather difficult. Tut's problem. If he were to die, part of me would die too. I'd like you to have just one martini with me, and then you may go, Mister Dollar. I had the one martini with the tall, stately woman who was struggling against tears. It was an old struggle with her, increasingly difficult, I guess, as the years kept on. We talked no more of his son, or the insurance, or the threat on his life. I left there about four o'clock in the afternoon. I drove back over to Providence and got to Doctor Shepard's office about a quarter to six. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. He got to his feet when I walked in. Doctor Shepard? No. Don't I know you? Yeah, I was thinking the same. Wait a minute. Yeah, your name is uh, Dollar. Your insurance investigator. Yeah, uh, uh, you're <laughs> Bill Phil... Crosby, yeah. Providence Police. <laughs> well, I met oh, you in New Hartford yeah. once. Oh, I didn't know you were down here. Hey, you must be the one. This Doctor Shepard called downtown about a threat in his life and said an insurance investigator had been slugged trying to help him out of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, where is he? I don't know. I rang that buzzer. There. There's no one around at all. What's this all about? Well, a man named Paul Forbes threatened the doctor's life. He slugged me. You got a pickup out on him yet? No, not yet. Try to pin the doctor down all day long. Been out on house calls, emergencies, everything else. We have to get his signature on a complaint. Mm, I thought that was all taken care of by now. Uh, well, hello. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Streeter. This is Phil Crosby from the police department. Police? I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, miss. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, well, goodness, he was here ten minutes ago. He sent me over to the pharmacy to pick up these things. Oh. What? We had an emergency, twelve thirteen Putnam Street. Got a note from him? Yes. Massey, please. But no name on this, Miss Streeter. You recognize the address at all? No, I don't. Doctor wouldn't take a random emergency unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual, Phil. This is down by the water. How bad off do you think Forbes is? Mad, had a gun, plenty rough. I rode down in the police car with Phil Crosby. I had a feeling about the acuteness of that emergency. 
As a matter of fact, I had a feeling about the acuteness of everything that had happened that day. From the time a half-crazed man had slugged me with a gun. The feeling was heavier than ever when we hit the neighborhood. Come on. All right. Wait. How oh, well. am 12.13 Putnam Street. That'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This is 12.40 here. The rest belongs to the warehouse. Yeah. Phil. Huh? That car empty on the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Shepard's car. Motor's still warm. Must be around here somewhere looking for the address. That's a dead end there. I better call in for some help. Fog's coming in if he's wandering around here. Yeah. Phil Crosby went off to find a telephone and request help. I stood by Dr. Shepard's car, waiting and listening and smoking. Nothing happened. No one cried out. No guns went off. Then Crosby drove up in the police car. Come on, report's in. A report was in, all right. We drove two blocks down the street where a small, curious crowd of people had already gathered in the cheerless fog. A uniformed man from the Harbor Division was standing over what appeared to be a bundle of clothes lying in a heap. We bent over it, and Phil looked up at me with a question mark. That Shepard, Johnny? Yeah, that's him. Yep, I'd say he's been dead less than half an hour. Johnny Dollar. Bill Crosby, Dollar. Were you in bed? No. Nope. Good. Put on your coat and come on downtown. Can't it wait till morning? Nope. Want me to send somebody out to pick you up? Are you talking about an arrest? I might be, Dollar. Whatever I have to do to keep you around. I'll make it under my own steam, pal. Fifteen minutes. Room 203 City Hall, okay? I may take 16 minutes if I feel like it. And maybe you'll need longer. I want a real good story about Paul Forbes. A better one than you've told so far. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Swindle sheet item 7, 10 cents, one newspaper. It carried the story of Dr. Shepherd's murder and told how his life had been threatened by Paul Forbes earlier in the week. Obviously, Dr. Charles Shepherd had been lured to his death by Forbes who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited until the victim appeared, and then shot him down. The police had an APB out for Paul Forbes. All parties concerned were notified. The deceased was survived by his mother, Mrs. Clara Shepherd of Pawtucket. Amen. Come right in, Dollar. Sit down. There were about six people in Crosby's office, among them Richard Porter, who had hired me to investigate Shepard because of a suspicious insurance application. A uniformed officer from the Harbor Patrol who had discovered Shepard's body, and two other men from Crosby's staff. I told them how I had been hired, that I didn't believe all of Shepard's story about the threat on his life. I told them about Forbes slugging me for no apparent reason. I also mentioned the insurance matter had never been satisfactorily explained. Well, it's never going to be explained as far as I can see, Dollar. Oh, I'll find an explanation, Phil. You solve your murder and I'll do what I have We've to do. We've got it solved. All you have to do is pick up Forbes. You know that. I don't know anything. You get huffy with me on the phone and you start talking about arrest and I don't know anything. You said that when you went to see Shepard yesterday morning, he waved a gun at you. A thirty-two. That's right. It wasn't on his body. He knew Forbes hadn't been picked up. His life was in as much danger as ever. Why didn't he carry the gun? You know, that's a pretty good question, Phil. Yeah. What else? He allegedly went out on an emergency call tonight. No little black bag in his car. No little black bag by his body. What doctor goes out on any call without his bag? Oh, I wouldn't let that worry me so much. I'd find out if it was an emergency. Or he knew who was going to meet him when he went out. I thought you might have some ideas. Have you talked to Mrs. Forbes? Of course I've talked to her. She hasn't any idea where her husband might be hiding. She's sure he killed Dr. Shepard. That servant in the house is sure. He told me about Shepard being threatened by Forbes. Shepard told you about being threatened. Forbes slugged you, slugged Mrs. Forbes. Been running around town like a madman all day. 
But everything you say and every way you say it, it comes out Shepard was lying. I did it on purpose. I wanted to worry you to death. Uh, well, every officer in this town has Forbes' description and the license of his car. We ought to get him before the night's out. He's the boy. Good luck, Phil. He was a good policeman with a lot of doubts. And he was mad about them. And that's what it generally takes to get matters straightened out. I found Kareem Streeter at the morgue, standing beside the marble slab on which a late employer had been laid. She looked pale and wan in her stiff white uniform and blue nurse's cape. Her eyes were red with tears, but no sound escaped her. Then she looked up at me once, sighed, and started out of the place. Wait. What now? Well, I'd... I'd like to help you. I... Can you help him? No. No, you can't. No one can. I tried. Who did it? Well, the, the police say Paul Forbes shot him. It looks that way from all they can gather. Over Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Oh. They're looking for him, I suppose? Yes. Well, you're something of a policeman, Mr. Dollar. Why aren't you out helping them or something? Please, Miss Streeter, I know we've I'll had words. i that question you asked me earlier today. What? You asked me if I loved Dr. Shepard. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I loved him. I loved him more than my whole life. <laughs> when she said that, and for some reason I don't know, I had a feeling that I was hearing the first bit of unembroidered truth I'd heard in two days. It didn't make me feel any better, but it did clear up something that had been in the back of my mind working its way to the front. Expense account item eight, six dollars and seventy cents. A steak, three martinis, and an order of sliced tomatoes. I finished eating at 2.30 in the morning. I really didn't want it, but I did want to sit down and do some thinking. After that, I climbed into my rented car and drove out to Dr. Shepard's office building. Expense account item nine, five dollars even. Bribe for watchman. I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. I sure appreciate it. Eh, too bad about Dr. Shepard. Nice fella. Yeah, very nice. What is it you think you'll find? Police been here till almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Oh, sure. Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it with him when he went out in that last emergency. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I won't be long. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to come right in and watch you. Shepard had been a thorough man, and from all evidence, he and Miss Streeter kept and operated an efficient file system in the office. However, he had kept no medical history of his prime patient, Pauline Forbes. As a matter of fact, in checking over both the patient's files and the card files, there was no evidence to indicate that Mrs. Forbes had ever been a patient of Shepard's, which seemed strange in view of the fact that he told me he treated her for 14 months or better, and ended the treatment by advising her to divorce her husband. What's more, he had never mentioned that Paul Forbes had been one of his patients. But an entry dated some two years before disclosed the fact that Dr. Shepard had examined, treated, and discharged Paul Forbes as a patient. These two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I'd need for a while. Nurse Corrine Streeter's home address was duly noted on Dr. Shepard's phone book. Oakdale House, surprisingly enough, on Oakdale Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 205. Yes. Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I only got home about 15 minutes ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Then Dr. Shepard's mother came. Do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straight... <laughs> well, things, <laughs> things like tonight aren't easy, I know, but... Look, Miss Streeter... I wish you'd help me and tell me who Dr. Shepard was intending to marry. Marry? Why, I had no idea. I was in the office a half an hour ago. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon, reservations on the Ile de France for next June. Any ideas? Please go. I can't. Look, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. I mean, was it Mrs. Forbes? What? Look, Miss Streeter, things are all wrong about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll all come out sooner or later. Oh, I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar, but Mrs. Forbes was the only person doctors saw socially this last year, and she, of course, is married. How'd they meet? When her husband was Dr. Shepard's patient? Yes, that's right. They became quite friendly. Mrs. Forbes was never a patient, but Mr. Forbes was. Now, what can you tell me about Mr. Forbes? 
Well, he came to see Dr. Shepard a year or two ago and stopped coming in. I believe he requested a copy of his medical history to be sent to another doctor in Baltimore, I think it was. Uh Uh-huh. But Dr. Shepard kept right on seeing Mrs. Forbes. Yes. All right. Do you have any idea why I was called in by the insurance broker? At first, I didn't. But I I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Forbes. What does it all mean? (sighs) It'll sicken you, Miss Tatum. Well, tell me if you know. Tell me, please. It means the wrong man was killed tonight. I was pretty sure of what I meant when I said that. And I was also pretty sure that Phil Crosby and the police department had recognized the setup. It so happened I had a head start in the way of information. And though it was six o'clock in the morning by that time, I decided to use it. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. I'd like to come in. What is it? I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police and all out looking for Paul and Dr. Shepard being killed. Stop looking pained and tired. I'm the guy that's tired. I'm the one who was going to be the star witness when the state tried Shepard for killing your husband. What? Why not get a star witness for free? Why not make a suspicious insurance move so an investigator would be called in? An investigator who'll back up a self-defense plea for your doctor and get him off on justifiable homicide. Get out of here. Get out of here. I'll call the police. And you and the doctor sail to France in June and live happily ever after? What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, then it must have been that way. Only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your boyfriend after all, just as he threatened to. Get out of here! You can't prove any of it. Not one word of it. Oh, you're right about that, Mrs. Forbes. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. Shepard's dead, and they want your husband for it. He threatened Shepard. And they'll get him for it, and that's that. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Your doctor's gone. He'll never come back. Or maybe you can just have a cup of coffee and forget all about it. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Yeah, that's it, Phil. That's what was supposed to happen. Shepard had it planted all over town how Forbes had threatened his life. He had witnesses. He had me, even. All he had to do was go out and shoot Forbes any place, any time. But Forbes got him first. Can people get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law? If and when you get your hands on Paul Forbes, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, he'll get him, Dollar. The other I can't answer. What you just told me can't be proven. I don't see how a lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and then finally guns him down, do you? But it was Forbes who was the marked man all this time. He was supposed to die. If it could be proved that Forbes was a patsy, that the doctor intended to gun him down... The judge and jury, Johnny. When we get Forbes, he'll be arraigned and indicted for first-degree murder. Don't worry about that part. But the rest is up to the court, out of our hands. After all, we're pretty sure Forbes shot and killed Dr. Shepard. Hang up that phone, Dollar. You still on the wire, Johnny? Hang it up or I'll blow your head off. Paul Forbes looked the part of a fugitive. His coat was ripped in several places. The knuckles on his left hand were torn and raw. There was mud on his shoes and pant legs. His eyes told the rest of the story. He was blazing mad. He had a gun. And he wasn't afraid to use it. Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator, Mr. Dollar. Will you cut off? I, uh... Don't tell him to let any more calls in here. Come on! I was cut off, but I'd rather get some sleep now. Anybody phones, just take a message. All right, Mr. Dollar. Over there. Sit down. Put your hands on your knees. Now, just so as you and I understand each other. You make one move... Wiggle a finger, I'll empty this gun right in your stomach. You understand me? I understand you, Forbes. You're crazy. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepard matter. I was pretty sick of it and with it when I had Paul Forbes visit me in my hotel room about 7 o'clock in the morning. He'd used a gun in front of me once before to crack my skull. I decided I'd try to avoid that again. So I sat down and I played good. It didn't seem to please him a bit. 
You were out to my house about an hour ago, weren't you? Yeah, I went out to talk to your wife. Yeah, I saw you. I was across the street watching. I followed you here. Fixing up another deal, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Forbes. I followed you here so we could have a little talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you, Forbes. Where do you live? In Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, where do you live in town here in Providence? I don't. I live in Hartford. Where do you practice? Practice what? Are you trying to get funny with me? I don't practice anything here in Providence. I don't live here. I'm just here for a few days. Doing what? Working on an insurance matter. Insurance matter? You're licensed to practice law in Rhode Island? Oh, you've got something all wrong, Forbes. I don't practice law. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an insurance investigator. I tried to tell you that yesterday morning when you cracked me with that gun. I was called in by Dr. Shepard. He said you threatened his life. You're lying to me. Shepard called me yesterday morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about getting Pauline a divorce. You're a lawyer! I'm what I say I am. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there yesterday. You got a billfold or something? My coat pocket inside on the back of that chair there. I think I know why Shepard called you and told you I was a lawyer. I think he wanted you to attack me and make me Shut a... Shut up! You and Shepard are trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. And now you're trying to pull something to get out of this jam. You're wrong, Forbes. I don't know anything about trying to take your wife away from you. You know I didn't kill Shepard. How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people have attested to that. I know you had a reason to kill him. I know every time I've seen you, you had a gun in your hands and you've been swinging it at somebody, particularly me. You know who did it. You're in on it somewhere. You know who killed Shepard and you're going to clear me. You're going to tell me, Dollar. I'm going to whip it out of you. You crazy (laughs) girl. All right. Get on your feet. He sat in the chair just the way I propped him there. His eyes looked dull and lifeless, as though he were already dead. I couldn't think of anything brilliant to say or do, so I rummaged around my suitcase and pulled out a bottle. Then I found a pair of glasses in the bathroom and poured a couple of drinks. When I came on out, he hadn't moved from the chair. He looked crumpled like a worn-out suit of clothes. He made no effort to look at me when I tucked the glass in his hand. Here, try this. Go on, go on, drink it. Why don't you call the police? Now you say you followed me here to have a talk and find out what's what. Now's the time to talk, pal. This thing isn't the best conversation piece in the world. Leave me alone. Call him in. You have something going for you here. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No. Dollar, I didn't kill Dr. Shepard. I wanted to more than anything in the world. But I didn't kill him. Now look, I want some facts. So let's start with last night. Where were you when Shepard was shot? How do I know where I was? I uh, I don't even know what time he was shot. All right, let's start with yesterday morning. You slugged me, ran out of the house, jumped in a car, and what happened? Go on, take it from there. I drove over to Dr. Shepard's office. I was going to have it out with him. He was breaking up my home. Well, go on. Did you see him? No. I parked down the street from his office... And then I saw him jump in his car, and I followed him. He came back over here. I knew my wife must have called him to take care of you. What happened then? I went over to the park and... sat and tried to figure things out. You don't know what I've been through this past year. All right, go on, go on. Then I went to a bar. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. I got a couple of sandwiches, and then I had some drinks. I don't know how many... Anyhow, the, the more I drank, the more hopeless everything looked. Did you call Shepard? Yeah. Yeah, I, I called him from the bar. Any idea what time it was? Must have been around five or six. What difference does it all make? I'm cooked and you know it. Go on, will you? You called Shepard. Then what did you do? I told him I wanted to talk to him about everything that had happened. I told him where to meet me. You mean you wanted Dr. Shepard to come down and meet you so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that in my mind. I don't know. On the phone, he sounded so calm and said we could talk it out and straighten it out like gentlemen. Did you talk to him? No. 
I didn't see him at all. I waited an hour and he never showed up. I called his office back and the answering service said everyone had gone out for the day and I, I didn't know what to do. I got back in my car and turned on the radio and that's where I heard I was wanted for murder. Dollar, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I had reason enough, but I didn't. I knew all about the others, but this was wait serious. Minute, wait a minute. What others? Pauline's always had other friends. <laughs> friends. I, I guess... <sighs> I don't know. I don't, I don't guess I love her anymore. I don't know. I don't think she ever loved me. But I needed her. I needed her more than anything this last year or so. And at times I, I did love her the way it once was. And I found out what was going on between her and Shepard. She wanted a divorce. I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her and Shepard get away with it, it would have been too much to take. To ask. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Even though you didn't love her and she didn't love you, you wouldn't stand still for a divorce action? It sounds stupid. I just told you. I needed her so much this last year or so. So much. Still doesn't make any sense, Forbes. Why didn't you let her go? She knew she didn't have to divorce me. She knew it wouldn't be too long. What? Shepard gave me a year. Another doctor in Baltimore, 18 months. Leukemia. Don't you see? She would have been free. They could have waited until I was dead at least. Just that, until I was dead. Couldn't they? Well, couldn't they? Expense account item 10, $2, sleeping pills. I fed them to him along with a cup of hot chocolate. He looked pretty worn out, and within 15 minutes, he was sound asleep in my bed. Item 11, $4.16, one long-distance phone call to a Baltimore clinic where I spoke with a Dr. Franz Mueller. Dr. Mueller confirmed what Forbes had said. Forbes was doomed with an incurable ailment. Item 12, 20 cents, another phone call, this one from the hotel lobby to the coroner's office. I learned that Shepard had been killed by 32 caliber slugs. Forbes' gun, a 32, had not been fired or hastily cleaned. His story was checking out. That left just one small item to be cleared up. Expense account item 13, $4. Taxi fare from my hotel back to the Oakdale home. Special rates for nurses. Hello. I thought you'd be back to see me. Somehow I'm glad it's you, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead. That's an old story. Terribly old and corny. I applied for a job as Dr. Shepard's nurse five years ago, and I fell in love with him that very day. I've loved him every day from that time on. Five years. Go on. I don't know when it was when you started up with Mrs. Forbes. I knew she was trying to get a divorce. I knew Mr. Forbes wouldn't stand for it. Then one day... Last week, I guess it was. I heard Doctor talking to her on the phone. He said, there's a way to get rid of him. I knew he was talking about getting rid of Mr. Forbes. Did they discuss the part about Shepard getting Forbes to threaten his life in front of witnesses so he could shoot him down when the time came? No, I didn't know that until yesterday morning. So long ago, it seems. You came to see Doctor, and then you left. I overheard him on the phone again. He called up Mr. Forbes and said Mr. Dollar was coming over to talk about the divorce action. And he knew Forbes would be upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about anticipating what people would do in given situations. <laughs> Even me. I was in the office when Mr. Forbes called last night. I saw a doctor put the gun in his coat. I knew he was going down to meet Mr. Forbes and shoot him. So I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Forbes with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy, that Mrs. Forbes wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. We struggled. The gun went off. I don't know how many times. I can help you, Corinne. You didn't mean to kill him. He meant to shoot you. When all these other details come out, the most they can charge you with is secondary justifiable or manslaughter. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. Huh? I guess the police haven't found her yet. 
I went over and killed Mrs. Forbes an hour ago. Expense account item 14, same as item 1. Transportation back to Hartford. The next time you have a doubtful insurance application, Mr. Porter, settle it yourself or call someone else. Don't call me. As far as I can add up, and I'm not going to recheck the figures, expense account total is $485. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the case of a lonely heart that found plenty of company in the nearest morgue. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Barney Phillips, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Well, all right, Hearth and Homies, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Make sure to click the link below and check out the Johnny Dollar Club. That's right, you can support the channel starting at only a dollar a month, and it gives you access to exclusive free content just for you. And remember, Hearth and Home Entertainment is totally supported by viewers like you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hey, <laughs> 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 <laughs>